When I was 30 years of age, I was living with the exiles on the Kabar River. On the fifth day of the fourth month, the sky opened up and I saw visions of God. It was the fifth day of the month in the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim that God's word came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, on the banks of the Kabar River in the country of Babylon. God's hand came upon him that day. I looked, I saw an immense dust storm come from the north, an immense cloud with lightning flashing from it, a huge ball of fire glowing like bronze. Within the fire were what looked like four creatures vibrant with life. Each had the form of a human being, but each also had four faces and four wings. Their legs were as sturdy and straight as columns, but their feet were hoofed like those of a calf and sparkled from the fire like burnished bronze. On all four sides under their wings they had human hands. All four had both faces and wings, with the wings touching one another. They turned neither one way nor the other, they went straight forward. Their faces looked like this, in front a human face, on the right side the face of a lion, on the left the face of an ox, and in back the face of an eagle. So much for the faces. The wings were spread out with the tips of one pair touching the creature on either side, the other pair of wings covered its body. Each creature went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit went, they went. They didn't turn as they went. The four creatures looked like a blazing fire, or like fiery torches. Tongues of fire shot back and forth between the creatures, and out of the fire, bolts of lightning. The creatures flashed back and forth like strikes of lightning. As I watched the four creatures, I saw something that looked like a wheel on the ground beside each of the four-faced creatures. This is what the wheels looked like, they were identical wheels, sparkling like diamonds in the sun. It looked like they were wheels within wheels, like a gyroscope. They went in any one of the four directions they faced, but straight, not veering off. The rims were immense, circled with eyes. When the living creatures went, the wheels went, when the living creatures lifted off, the wheels lifted off. Wherever the spirit went, they went, the wheels sticking right with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures went, the wheels went, when the creatures stopped, the wheels stopped, when the creatures lifted off, the wheels lifted off, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures was something like a dome, shimmering like a sky full of cut glass, vaulted over their heads. Under the dome one set of wings was extended toward the others, with another set of wings covering their bodies. When they moved I heard their wings, it was like the roar of a great waterfall, like the voice of the strong God, like the noise of a battlefield. When they stopped, they folded their wings. And then, as they stood with folded wings, there was a voice from above the dome over their heads. Above the dome there was something that looked like a throne, sky blue like a sapphire, with a human-like figure towering above the throne. From what I could see, from the waist up he looked like burnished bronze and from the waist down like a blazing fire. Brightness everywhere. The way a rainbow springs out of the sky on a rainy day, that's what it was like. It turned out to be the glory of God. When I saw all this, I fell to my knees, my face to the ground. Then I heard a voice. It said, Son of man, stand up. I have something to say to you. The moment I heard the voice, the Spirit entered me and put me on my feet. As he spoke to me, I listened. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the family of Israel, a rebellious nation if there ever was one. 
They and their ancestors have fomented rebellion right up to the present. They're a hard case, these people to whom I'm sending you, hardened in their sin. Tell them, this is the message of God, the Master. They are a defiant bunch. Whether or not they listen, at least they'll know that a prophet's been here. But don't be afraid of them, son of man, and don't be afraid of anything they say. Don't be afraid when living among them is like stepping on thorns or finding scorpions in your bed. Don't be afraid of their mean words or their hard looks. They're a bunch of rebels. Your job is to speak to them. Whether they listen is not your concern. They're hardened rebels. Only take care, son of man, that you don't rebel like these rebels. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. When I looked he had his hand stretched out to me, and in the hand a book, a scroll. He unrolled the scroll. On both sides, front and back, were written lamentations and mourning and doom. He told me, Son of man, eat what you see. Eat this book. Then go and speak to the family of Israel. As I opened my mouth, he gave me the scroll to eat, saying, Son of man, eat this book that I am giving you. Make a full meal of it. So I ate it. It tasted so good, just like honey. Then he told me, Son of man, go to the family of Israel and speak my message. Look, I'm not sending you to a people who speak a hard-to-learn language with words you can hardly pronounce. If I had sent you to such people, their ears would have perked up and they would have listened immediately. But it won't work that way with the family of Israel. They won't listen to you because they won't listen to me. They are, as I said, a hard case, hardened in their sin. But I'll make you as hard in your way as they are in theirs. I'll make your face as hard as rock, harder than granite. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't be afraid of them, even though they're a bunch of rebels. Then he said, Son of man, get all these words that I'm giving you inside you. Listen to them obediently. Make them your own. And now go. Go to the exiles, your people, and speak. Tell them, this is the message of God, the Master. Speak your peace, whether they listen or not. Then the Spirit picked me up. Behind me I heard a great commotion, blessed be the glory of God in his sanctuary. The wings of the living creatures beating against each other, the whirling wheels, the rumble of a great earthquake. The Spirit lifted me and took me away. I went bitterly and angrily. I didn't want to go. But God had me in His grip. I arrived among the exiles who lived near the Kabar River at Tel Aviv. I came to where they were living and sat there for seven days, appalled. At the end of the seven days, I received this message from God. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the family of Israel. Whenever you hear me say something, warn them for me. If I say to the wicked, you are going to die, and you don't sound the alarm warning them that it's a matter of life or death, they will die and it will be your fault. I'll hold you responsible. But if you warn the wicked and they keep right on sinning anyway, they'll most certainly die for their sin, but you won't die. You'll have saved your life. And if the righteous turn back from living righteously and take up with evil when I step in and put them in a hard place, they'll die. If you haven't warned them, they'll die because of their sins, and none of the right things they've done will count for anything, and I'll hold you responsible. But if you warn these righteous people not to sin and they listen to you, they'll live because they took the warning, and again, you'll have saved your life. God grabbed me by the shoulder and said, Get up. 
Go out on the plane. I want to talk with you. So I got up and went out on the plane. I couldn't believe my eyes, the glory of God. Right there. It was like the glory I had seen at the Kabar River. I fell to the ground, prostrate. Then the Spirit entered me and put me on my feet. He said, Go home and shut the door behind you. And then something odd, Son of man, they'll tie you hand and foot with ropes so you can't leave the house. I'll make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so you won't be able to talk and tell the people what they're doing wrong, even though they are a bunch of rebels. But then when the time is ripe, I'll free your tongue and you'll say, this is what God, the Master, says, from then on it's up to them. They can listen or not listen, whichever they like. They are a bunch of rebels. Now, son of man, take a brick and place it before you. Draw a picture of the city Jerusalem on it. Then make a model of a military siege against the brick, build siege walls, construct a ramp, set up army camps, lay in battering rams around it. Then get an iron skillet and place it upright between you and the city, an iron wall. Face the model, the city shall be under siege and you shall be the besieger. This is a sign to the family of Israel. Next lie on your left side and place the sin of the family of Israel on yourself. You will bear their sin for as many days as you lie on your side. The number of days you bear their sin will match the number of years of their sin, namely, 390. For 390 days you will bear the sin of the family of Israel. Then, after you have done this, turn over and lie down on your right side and bear the sin of the family of Judah. Your assignment this time is to lie there for 40 days, a day for each year of their sin. Look straight at the siege of Jerusalem. Roll up your sleeve, shake your bare arm, and preach against her. I will tie you up with ropes, tie you so you can't move or turn over until you have finished the days of the siege. Next I want you to take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, dried millet and spelt, and mix them in a bowl to make a flat bread. This is your food ration for the 390 days you lie on your side. Measure out about half a pound for each day and eat it on schedule. Also measure out your daily ration of about a pint of water and drink it on schedule. Eat the bread as you would a muffin. Bake the muffins out in the open where everyone can see you, using dried human dung for fuel. God said, this is what the people of Israel are going to do, among the pagan nations where I will drive them, they will eat foods that are strictly taboo to a holy people. I said, God, my master. Never. I've never contaminated myself with food like that. Since my youth I've never eaten anything forbidden by law, nothing found dead or violated by wild animals. I've never taken a single bite of forbidden food. All right, he said. I'll let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human dung. Then he said to me, Son of man, I'm going to cut off all food from Jerusalem. The people will live on starvation rations, worrying where the next meal's coming from, scrounging for the next drink of water. Famine Conditions People will look at one another, see nothing but skin and bones, and shake their heads. This is what sin does. Now, son of man, take a sharp sword and use it as a straight razor, shaving your head and your beard. Then, using a set of balancing scales, divide the hair into thirds. When the days of the siege are over, take one third of the hair and burn it inside the city. Take another third, chop it into bits with the sword and sprinkle it around the city. The final third you'll throw to the wind. 
Then I'll go after them with a sword. Retrieve a few of the hairs and slip them into your pocket. Take some of them and throw them into the fire, burn them up. From them, fire will spread to the whole family of Israel. This is what God, the Master, says, this means Jerusalem. I set her at the center of the world, all the nations ranged around her. But she rebelled against my laws and ordinances, rebelled far worse than the nations ranged around her, sheer wickedness, refused my guidance, ignored my directions. Therefore this is what God, the Master, says, You've been more headstrong and willful than any of the nations around you, refusing my guidance, ignoring my directions. You've sunk to the gutter level of those around you. Therefore this is what God, the Master, says, I'm setting myself against you, yes, against you, Jerusalem. I'm going to punish you in full sight of the nations. Because of your disgusting no-God idols, I'm going to do something to you that I've never done before and will never do again, turn families into cannibals, parents eating children, children eating parents. Punishment indeed. And whoever's left over I'll throw to the winds. Therefore, as sure as I am the living God, decree of God, the Master, because you've polluted my sanctuary with your obscenities and disgusting no-God idols, I'm pulling out. Not an ounce of pity will I show you. A third of your people will die of either disease or hunger inside the city, a third will be killed outside the city, and a third will be thrown to the winds and chased by killers. Only then will I calm down and let my anger cool. Then you'll know that I was serious about this all along, that I'm a jealous God and not to be trifled with. When I get done with you, you'll be a pile of rubble. Nations who walk by will make coarse jokes. When I finish my angry punishment and searing rebukes, you'll be reduced to an object of ridicule and mockery, turned into a horror story circulating among the surrounding nations. I, God, have spoken. When I shoot my lethal famine arrows at you, I'll shoot to kill. Then I'll step up the famine and cut off food supplies. Famine and more famine, and then I'll send in the wild animals to finish off your children. Epidemic disease, unrestrained murder, death, and I will have sent it. I, God, have spoken. Then the word of God came to me, Son of man, now turn and face the mountains of Israel and preach against them. O mountains of Israel, listen to the message of God, the Master. God, the Master, speaks to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and the valleys, I am about to destroy your sacred God and goddess shrines. I'll level your altars, bust up your sun god pillars, and kill your people as they bow down to your no-god idols. I'll stack the dead bodies of Israelites in front of your idols and then scatter your bones around your shrines. Every place where you've lived, the towns will be torn down and the pagan shrines demolished, altars busted up, idols smashed, all your custom-made sun god pillars in ruins. Corpses everywhere you look. Then you'll know that I am God. But I'll let a few escape the killing as you are scattered through other lands and nations. In the foreign countries where they're taken as prisoners of war, they'll remember me. They'll realize how devastated I was by their betrayals, by their voracious lust for gratifying themselves in their idolatries. They'll be disgusted with their evil ways, disgusting to God in the way they've lived. They'll know that I am God. They'll know that my judgment against them was no empty threat. This is what God, the Master, says, clap your hands, stamp your feet, yell out, no, 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 because of all the evil obscenities rife in Israel. They're going to be killed, dying of hunger, dying of disease, death everywhere you look, 
people dropping like flies, people far away dying, people nearby dying, and whoever's left in the city starving to death. Why? Because I'm angry, furiously angry. They'll realize that I am God when they see their people's corpses strewn over and around all their ruined sex and religion shrines on the bare hills and in the lush fertility groves, in all the places where they indulge their sensual rites. I'll bring my hand down hard on them, demolish the country wherever they live, turn it into wasteland from one end to the other, from the wilderness to Ribla. Then they'll know that I am God. God's word came to me, saying, You, son of man, God, the master, has this message for the land of Israel. End time. The end of business as usual for everyone. It's all over. The end is upon you. I've launched my anger against you. I've issued my verdict on the way you live. I'll make you pay for your disgusting obscenities. I won't look the other way. I won't feel sorry for you. I'll make you pay for the way you've lived. Your disgusting obscenities will boomerang on you. And you'll realize that I am God. I, God, the Master, say. Disaster after disaster. Look, it comes. End time. The end comes. The end is ripe. Watch out, it's coming. This is your fate, you who live in this land. Time's up. It's zero hour. No dragging of feet now. No bargaining for more time. Soon now I'll pour my wrath on you. Pay out my anger against you. Render my verdict on the way you've lived. Make you pay for your disgusting obscenities. I won't look the other way. I won't feel sorry for you. I'll make you pay for the way you've lived. Your disgusting obscenities will boomerang on you. Then you'll realize. That it is I, God, who have hit you. Judgment Day. Fate has caught up with you. The scepter outsized and pretentious. Pride bursting all bounds. Violence strutting. Brandishing the evil scepter. But there's nothing to them. And nothing will be left of them. Time's up. Countdown, 5, 4, 3, 2. Buyer, don't boast, seller. Don't worry. Judgment wrath has turned the world topsy-turvy. The bottom has dropped out of buying and selling. It will never be the same again. But don't fantasize an upturn in the market. The country is bankrupt because of its sins. And it's not going to get any better. The trumpet signals the call to battle. Present arms. But no one marches into battle. My wrath has them paralyzed. On the open roads you're killed. Or else you go home and die of hunger and disease. Either get murdered out in the country. Or die of sickness or hunger in town. Survivors run for the hills. They moan like doves in the valleys. Each one moaning for his own sins. Every hand hangs limp. Every knee turns to rubber. They dress in rough burlap. Sorry scarecrows. Shifty and shamefaced. With their heads shaved bald. They throw their money into the gutters. Their hard-earned cash stinks like garbage. They find that it won't buy a thing. They either want or need on Judgment Day. They tripped on money. And fell into sin. Proud and pretentious with their jewels. They deck out their vile and vulgar no-gods in finery. 
I'll make those god obscenities a stench in their nostrils. I'll give away their religious junk. Strangers will pick it up for free. The godless spit on it and make jokes. I'll turn my face so I won't have to look. As my treasured place and people are violated. As violent strangers walk in. And desecrate place and people. A bloody massacre. As crime and violence fill the city. I'll bring in the dregs of humanity. To move into their houses. I'll put a stop to the boasting and strutting. Of the high and mighty. And see to it that there'll be nothing holy. Left in their holy places. Catastrophe descends. They look for peace. But there's no peace to be found. Disaster on the heels of disaster. One rumor after another. They clamor for the prophet to tell them what's up. But nobody knows anything. Priests don't have a clue. The elders don't know what to say. The king holds his head in despair. The prince is devastated. The common people are paralyzed. Gripped by fear, they can't move. I'll deal with them where they are. Judge them on their terms. They'll know that I am God. In the sixth year, in the sixth month and the fifth day, while I was sitting at home meeting with the leaders of Judah, it happened that the hand of my master, God, gripped me. When I looked, I was astonished. What I saw looked like a man, from the waist down like fire and from the waist up like highly burnished bronze. He reached out what looked like a hand and grabbed me by the hair. The Spirit swept me high in the air and carried me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the temple's inside court where the image of the sex goddess that makes God so angry had been set up. Right before me was the glory of the God of Israel, exactly like the vision I had seen out on the plain. He said to me, Son of man, look north. I looked north and saw it, just north of the entrance loomed the altar of the sex goddess, Asherah, that makes God so angry. Then he said, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? Outrageous obscenities and doing them right here. It's enough to drive me right out of my own temple. But you're going to see worse yet. He brought me to the door of the temple court. I looked and saw a gaping hole in the wall. He said, Son of man, dig through the wall. I dug through the wall and came upon a door. He said, now walk through the door and take a look at the obscenities they're engaging in. I entered and looked. I couldn't believe my eyes, painted all over the walls were pictures of reptiles and animals and monsters, the whole pantheon of Egyptian gods and goddesses, being worshipped by Israel. In the middle of the room were seventy of the leaders of Israel, with Jazaniah son of Shaphan standing in the middle. Each held his censer with the incense rising in a fragrant cloud. He said, Son of man, do you see what the elders are doing here in the dark, each one before his favorite God picture? They tell themselves, God doesn't see us. God has forsaken the country. Then he said, You're going to see worse yet. He took me to the entrance at the north gate of the temple of God. I saw women sitting there, weeping for Tammuz, the Babylonian fertility god. He said, Have you gotten an eyeful, son of man? You're going to see worse yet. Finally, he took me to the inside court of the temple of God. There between the porch and the altar were about twenty-five men. Their backs were to God's temple. They were facing east, bowing in worship to the sun. He said, Have you seen enough, son of man? 
Isn't it bad enough that Judah engages in these outrageous obscenities? They fill the country with violence and now provoke me even further with their obscene gestures. That's it. They have an angry God on their hands. From now on, no mercy. They can shout all they want, but I'm not listening. Then I heard him call out loudly, Executioners, come. And bring your deadly weapons with you. Six men came down the road from the upper gate that faces north, each carrying his lethal weapon. With them was a man dressed in linen with a writing case slung from his shoulder. They entered and stood by the bronze altar. The glory of the God of Israel ascended from his usual place above the cherubim angels, moved to the threshold of the temple, and called to the man with the writing case who was dressed in linen, Go through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the forehead of everyone who is in anguish over the outrageous obscenities being done in the city. I listened as he went on to address the executioners, follow him through the city and kill. Feel sorry for no one. Show no compassion. Kill old men and women, young men and women, mothers and children. But don't lay a hand on anyone with the mark. Start at my temple. They started with the leaders in front of the temple. He told the executioners, desecrate the temple. Fill it with corpses. Then go out and continue the killing. So they went out and struck the city. While the massacre went forward, I was left alone. I fell on my face in prayer, O, oh, O, oh, God, my Master. Are you going to kill everyone left in Israel in this pouring out of your anger on Jerusalem? He said, The guilt of Israel and Judah is enormous. The land is swollen with murder. The city is bloated with injustice. They all say, God has forsaken the country. He doesn't see anything we do. Well, I do see, and I'm not feeling sorry for any of them. They're going to pay for what they've done. Just then, the man dressed in linen and carrying the writing case came back and reported, I've done what you told me. When I next looked, oh. Above the dome over the heads of the cherubim angels was what looked like a throne, sky blue, like a sapphire. God said to the man dressed in linen, Enter the place of the wheels under the cherubim angels. Fill your hands with burning coals from beneath the cherubim and scatter them over the city. I watched as he entered. The cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man entered. A cloud filled the inside courtyard. Then the glory of God ascended from the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. The cloud filled the temple. Court and temple were both filled with the blazing presence of the glory of God. And the sound. The wings of the cherubim were audible all the way to the outer court, the sound of the voice was like the strong God in thunder. When God commanded the man dressed in linen, take fire from among the wheels, from between the cherubim, he went in and stood beside a wheel. One of the cherubim reached into the fire, took some coals, and put them in the hands of the man dressed in linen. He took them and went out. Something that looked like a human hand could be seen under the wings of the cherubim. And then I saw four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub. The wheels radiating were sparkling like diamonds in the sun. All four wheels looked alike, each like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions but in a perfectly straight line. Where the cherubim went, the wheels went straight ahead. The cherubim were full of eyes in their backs, hands, and wings. The wheels likewise were full of eyes. I heard the wheels called, wheels within wheels. 
Each of the cherubim had four faces, the first, of an angel, the second, a human, the third, a lion, the fourth, an eagle. Then the cherubim ascended. They were the same living creatures I had seen at the Kabar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels beside them moved. When the cherubim spread their wings to take off from the ground, the wheels stayed right with them. When the cherubim stopped, the wheels stopped. When the cherubim rose, the wheels rose, because the spirit of the living creatures was also in the wheels. Then the glory of God left the temple entrance and hovered over the cherubim. I watched as the cherubim spread their wings and left the ground, the wheels right with them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the temple. The glory of the God of Israel was above them. These were the same living creatures I had seen previously beneath the God of Israel at the Kabar River. I recognized them as cherubim. Each had four faces and four wings. Under their wings were what looked like human hands. Their faces looked exactly like those I had seen at the Kabar River. Each went straight ahead. Then the Spirit picked me up and took me to the gate of the temple that faces east. There were twenty-five men standing at the gate. I recognized the leaders, Jazaniah son of Azar and Pelatiah son of Benaiah. God said, Son of man, these are the men who draw up blueprints for sin, who think up new programs for evil in this city. They say, we can make anything happen here. We're the best. We're the choice pieces of meat in the soup pot. Oppose them, son of man. Preach against them. Then the Spirit of God came upon me and told me what to say, this is what God says, that's a fine public speech, Israel, but I know what you are thinking. You've murdered a lot of people in this city. The streets are piled high with corpses. Therefore this is what God, the Master, says, the corpses that you've piled in the streets are the meat and this city is the soup pot and you're not even in the pot. I'm throwing you out. You fear war, but war is what you're going to get. I'm bringing war against you. I'm throwing you out of this city, giving you over to foreigners, and punishing you good. You'll be killed in battle. I'll carry out judgment on you at the borders of Israel. Then you'll realize that I am God. This city will not be your soup pot and you won't be the choice pieces of meat in it either. Hardly. I will carry out judgment on you at the borders of Israel and you'll realize that I am God, for you haven't followed my statutes and ordinances. Instead of following my ways, you've sunk to the level of the laws of the nations around you. Even while I was preaching, Pelatiah son of Benaiah died. I fell down, face to the ground, and prayed loudly, O Master, God! Will you completely wipe out what's left of Israel? The answer from God came back, Son of man, your brothers, I mean the whole people of Israel who are in exile with you, are the people of whom the citizens of Jerusalem are saying, they're in the far country, far from God. This land has been given to us to own. Well, tell them this, this is your message from God, the Master. True, I sent you to the far country and scattered you through other lands. All the same, I've provided you a temporary sanctuary in the countries where you've gone. I will gather you back from those countries and lands where you've been scattered and give you back the land of Israel. You'll come back and clean house, throw out all the rotten images and obscene idols. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll cut out your stone heart and replace it with a red-blooded, firm-muscled heart. Then you'll obey my statutes and be careful to obey my commands. 
You'll be my people. I'll be your God. But not those who are self-willed and addicted to their rotten images and obscene idols. I'll see that they're paid in full for what they've done. Decree of God, the Master. Then the cherubim spread their wings, with the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel hovering over them. The glory of God ascended from within the city and rested on the mountain to the east of the city. Then, still in the vision given me by the Spirit of God, the Spirit took me and carried me back to the exiles in Babylon. And then the vision left me. I told the exiles everything that God had shown me. God's message came to me, Son of man, you're living with a bunch of rebellious people. They have eyes but don't see a thing, they have ears but don't hear a thing. They're rebels all. So, son of man, pack up your exile duffel bags. Leave in broad daylight with everyone watching and go off, as if into exile. Maybe then they'll understand what's going on, rebels though they are. You'll take up your baggage while they watch, a bundle of the bare necessities of someone going into exile, and toward evening leave, just like a person going off into exile. As they watch, dig through the wall of the house and carry your bundle through it. In full sight of the people, put the bundle on your shoulder and walk out into the night. Cover your face so you won't have to look at what you'll never see again. I'm using you as a sign for the family of Israel. I did exactly as he commanded me. I got my stuff together and brought it out in the street where everyone could see me, bundled it up the way someone being taken off into exile would, and then, as the sun went down, made a hole in the wall of the house with my hands. As it grew dark and as they watched, I left, throwing my bundle across my shoulders. The next morning God spoke to me, Son of man, when anyone in Israel, that bunch of rebels, asks you, what are you doing? Tell them, God, the Master, says that this message especially concerns the prince in Jerusalem, Zedekiah, but includes all the people of Israel. Also tell them, I am drawing a picture for you. As I am now doing, it will be done to all the people of Israel. They will go into exile as captives. The prince will put his bundle on his shoulders in the dark and leave. He'll dig through the wall of the house, covering his face so he won't have to look at the land he'll never see again. But I'll make sure he gets caught and is taken to Babylon. Blinded, he'll never see that land in which he'll die. I'll scatter to the four winds those who helped him escape, along with his troops, and many will die in battle. They'll realize that I am God when I scatter them among foreign countries. I'll permit a few of them to escape the killing, starvation, and deadly sickness so that they can confess among the foreign countries all the disgusting obscenities they've been involved in. They will realize that I am God. God's message came to me, Son of Man, eat your meals shaking in your boots, drink your water trembling with fear. Tell the people of this land, everyone living in Jerusalem and Israel, God's message, you'll eat your meals shaking in your boots and drink your water in terror because your land is going to be stripped bare as punishment for the brutality rampant in it. All the cities and villages will be emptied out and the fields destroyed. Then you'll realize that I am God. God's message came to me, Son of Man, What's this proverb making the rounds in the land of Israel that says, everything goes on the same as ever, all the prophetic warnings are false alarms. Tell them, God, the Master, says, this proverb's going to have a short life. Tell them, time's about up. Every warning is about to come true. False alarms and easygoing preaching are a thing of the past in the life of Israel. I, God, am doing the speaking. 
what I say happens. None of what I say is on hold. What I say, I'll do, and soon, you rebels. Decree of God the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, do you hear what Israel is saying, that the alarm the prophet raises is for a long time off, that he's preaching about the far-off future? Well, tell them, God, the Master, says, nothing of what I say is on hold. What I say happens. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, preach against the prophets of Israel who are making things up out of their own heads and calling it prophesying. Preach to them the real thing. Tell them, listen to God's message. God, the Master, pronounces doom on the empty-headed prophets who do their own thing and know nothing of what's going on. Your prophets, Israel, are like jackals scavenging through the ruins. They haven't lifted a finger to repair the defenses of the city and have risked nothing to help Israel stand on God's day of judgment. All they do is fantasize comforting illusions and preach lying sermons. They say, God says, when God hasn't so much as breathed in their direction. And yet they stand around thinking that something they said is going to happen. Haven't you fantasized sheer nonsense? Aren't your sermons tissues of lies, saying, God says, when I've done nothing of the kind? Therefore, and this is the message of God, the Master, remember, I'm dead set against prophets who substitute illusions for visions and use sermons to tell lies. I'm going to ban them from the council of my people, remove them from membership in Israel, and outlaw them from the land of Israel. Then you'll realize that I am God, the Master. The fact is that they've lied to my people. They've said, no problem, everything's just fine when things are not at all fine. When people build a wall, they're right behind them slapping on whitewash. Tell those who are slapping on the whitewash, when a torrent of rain comes and the hailstones crash down and the hurricane sweeps in and the wall collapses, what's the good of the whitewash that you slapped on so liberally, making it look so good? And that's exactly what will happen. I, God, the Master, Say so, I'll let the hurricane of my wrath loose, a torrent of my hailstone anger. I'll make that wall you've slapped with whitewash collapse. I'll level it to the ground so that only the foundation stones will be left. And in the ruin you'll all die. You'll realize then that I am God. I'll dump my wrath on that wall, all of it, and on those who plastered it with whitewash. I will say to them, there is no wall, and those who did such a good job of whitewashing it wasted their time, those prophets of Israel who preached to Jerusalem and announced all their visions telling us things were just fine when they weren't at all fine. Decree of God, the Master And the women prophets, son of man, take your stand against the women prophets who make up stuff out of their own minds. Oppose them. Say, doom, to the women who sew magic bracelets and head scarves to suit every taste, devices to trap souls. Say, will you kill the souls of my people, use living souls to make yourselves rich and popular? You have profaned me among my people just to get ahead yourselves, used me to make yourselves look good, killing souls who should never have died and coddling souls who shouldn't live. You've lied to people who love listening to lies. Therefore God says, I am against all the devices and techniques you use to hunt down souls. I'll rip them out of your hands. I'll free the souls you're trying to catch. I'll rip your magic bracelets and scarves to shreds and deliver my people from your influence so they'll no longer be victimized by you. That's how you'll come to realize that I am God. Because you've confounded and confused good people, unsuspecting and innocent people, 
with your lies, and because you've made it easy for others to persist in evil so that it wouldn't even dawn on them to turn to me so I could save them, as of now you're finished. No more delusion mongering from you, no more sermonic lies. I'm going to rescue my people from your clutches. And you'll realize that I am God. Some of the leaders of Israel approached me and sat down with me. God's message came to me, Son of man, these people have installed idols in their hearts. They have embraced the wickedness that will ruin them. Why should I even bother with their prayers? Therefore tell them, the message of God, the Master, all in Israel who install idols in their hearts and embrace the wickedness that will ruin them and still have the gall to come to a prophet, be on notice, I, God, will step in and personally answer them as they come dragging along their mob of idols. I am ready to go to work on the hearts of the house of Israel, all of whom have left me for their idols. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, God, the Master, says, Repent. Turn your backs on your no-God idols. Turn your backs on all your outrageous obscenities. To every last person from the house of Israel, including any of the resident aliens who live in Israel, all who turn their backs on me and embrace idols, who install the wickedness that will ruin them at the center of their lives and then have the gall to go to the prophet to ask me questions, God, will step in and give the answer myself. I'll oppose those people to their faces, make an example of them, a warning lesson, and get rid of them so you will realize that I am God. If a prophet is deceived and tells these idolaters the lies they want to hear, I, God, get blamed for those lies. He won't get by with it. I'll grab him by the scruff of the neck and get him out of there. They'll be equally guilty, the prophet and the one who goes to the prophet, so that the house of Israel will never again wander off my paths and make themselves filthy in their rebellions, but will rather be my people, just as I am their God. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, when a country sins against me by living faithlessly and I reach out and destroy its food supply by bringing on a famine, wiping out humans and animals alike, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job, the big three, were alive at the time, it wouldn't do the population any good. Their righteousness would only save their own lives. Decree of God, the Master or, if I make wild animals go through the country so that everyone has to leave and the country becomes wilderness and no one dares enter it anymore because of the wild animals, even if these three men were living there, as sure as I am the living God, neither their sons nor daughters would be rescued, but only those three, and the country would revert to wilderness. Or, if I bring war on that country and give the order, let the killing begin, leaving both people and animals dead, even if those three men were alive at the time, as sure as I am the living God, neither sons nor daughters would be rescued, but only these three. Or, if I visit a deadly disease on that country, pouring out my lethal anger, killing both people and animals, and Noah, Daniel, and Job happened to be alive at the time, as sure as I am the living God, not a son, not a daughter, would be rescued. Only these three would be delivered because of their righteousness. Now then, that's the picture, says God, the Master, once I've sent my four catastrophic judgments on Jerusalem, war, famine, wild animals, disease, to kill off people and animals alike. But look! Believe it or not, there'll be survivors. Some of their sons and daughters will be brought out. When they come out to you and their salvation is right in your face, you'll see for yourself the life they've been saved from. You'll know that this severe judgment I brought on Jerusalem was worth it, that it had to be. Yes, when you see in detail the kind of lives they've been living, you'll feel much better. 
you'll see the reason behind all that I've done in Jerusalem. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of man, how would you compare the wood of a vine with the branches of any tree you'd find in the forest? Is vine wood ever used to make anything? Is it used to make pegs to hang things from? I don't think so. At best it's good for fuel. Look at it, a flimsy piece of vine, thrown in the fire and then rescued, the ends burned off and the middle charred. Now is it good for anything? Hardly. When it was whole it wasn't good for anything. Half burned is no improvement. What's it good for? So here's the message of God, the Master, like the wood of the vine I selected from among the trees of the forest and used as fuel for the fire, just so I'll treat those who live in Jerusalem. I am dead set against them. Even though at one time they got out of the fire charred, the fire's going to burn them up. When I take my stand against them, you'll realize that I am God. I'll turn this country into a wilderness because they've been faithless. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, confront Jerusalem with her outrageous violations. Say this, the message of God, the Master, to Jerusalem, you were born and bred among Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born your umbilical cord was not cut, you weren't bathed and cleaned up, you weren't rubbed with salt, you weren't wrapped in a baby blanket. No one cared a fig for you. No one did one thing to care for you tenderly in these ways. You were thrown out into a vacant lot and left there, dirty and unwashed, a newborn nobody wanted. And then I came by. I saw you all miserable and bloody. Yes, I said to you, lying there helpless and filthy, live. Grow up like a plant in the field. And you did. You grew up. You grew tall and matured as a woman, full-breasted, with flowing hair. But you were naked and vulnerable, fragile and exposed. I came by again and saw you, saw that you were ready for love and a lover. I took care of you, dressed you and protected you. I promised you my love and entered the covenant of marriage with you. I, God, the Master, gave my word. You became mine. I gave you a good bath, washing off all that old blood, and anointed you with aromatic oils. I dressed you in a colorful gown and put leather sandals on your feet. I gave you linen blouses and a fashionable wardrobe of expensive clothing. I adorned you with jewelry, I placed bracelets on your wrists, fitted you out with a necklace, emerald rings, sapphire earrings, and a diamond tiara. You were provided with everything precious and beautiful, with exquisite clothes and elegant food, garnished with honey and oil. You were absolutely stunning. You were a queen. You became world famous, a legendary beauty brought to perfection by my adornments. Decree of God, the Master. But your beauty went to your head and you became a common whore, grabbing anyone coming down the street and taking him into your bed. You took your fine dresses and made tents of them, using them as brothels in which you practiced your trade. This kind of thing should never happen, never. And then you took all that fine jewelry I gave you, my gold and my silver, and made pornographic images of them for your brothels. You decorated your beds with fashionable silks and cottons, and perfumed them with my aromatic oils and incense. And then you set out the wonderful foods I provided, the fresh breads and fruits, with fine herbs and spices, which were my gifts to you, and you served them as delicacies in your whorehouses. That's what happened, says God, the Master. 
And then you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had given birth to as my children, and you killed them, sacrificing them to idols. Wasn't it bad enough that you had become a whore? And now you're a murderer, killing my children and sacrificing them to idols. Not once during these years of outrageous obscenities and whorings did you remember your infancy, when you were naked and exposed, a blood-smeared newborn. And then to top off all your evil acts, you built your bold brothels in every town square. Doom. Doom to you, says God, the Master. At every major intersection you built your bold brothels and exposed your sluttish sex, spreading your legs for everyone who passed by. And then you went international with your whoring. You fornicated with the Egyptians, seeking them out in their sex orgies. The more promiscuous you became, the angrier I got. Finally, I intervened, reduced your borders and turned you over to the rapacity of your enemies. Even the Philistine women, can you believe it, were shocked at your sluttish life. You went on to fornicate with the Assyrians. Your appetite was insatiable. But still you weren't satisfied. You took on the Babylonians, a country of businessmen, and still you weren't satisfied. What a sick soul. Doing all this stuff, the champion whore. You built your bold brothels at every major intersection, opened up your whorehouses in every neighborhood, but you were different from regular whores in that you wouldn't accept a fee. Wives who are unfaithful to their husbands accept gifts from their lovers. And men commonly pay their whores. But you pay your lovers. You bribe men from all over to come to bed with you. You're just the opposite of the regular whores who get paid for sex. Instead, you pay men for their favors. You even pervert whoredom. Therefore, whore, listen to God's message, I, God, the Master, say, because you've been unrestrained in your promiscuity, stripped down for every lover, flaunting your sex, and because of your pornographic idols and all the slaughtered children you offer to them, Therefore, because of all this, I'm going to get all your lovers together, all those you've used for your own pleasure, the ones you loved and the ones you loathed. I'll assemble them as a courtroom of spectators around you. In broad daylight I'll strip you naked before them, they'll see what you really look like. Then I'll sentence you to the punishment for an adulterous woman and a murderous woman. I'll give you a taste of my wrath. I'll gather all your lovers around you and turn you over to them. They'll tear down your bold brothels and sex shrines. They'll rip off your clothes, take your jewels, and leave you naked and exposed. Then they'll call for a mass meeting. The mob will stone you and hack you to pieces with their swords. They'll burn down your houses. A massive judgment, with all the women watching. I'll have put a full stop to your whoring life, no more paying lovers to come to your bed. By then my anger will be played out. My jealousy will subside. Because you didn't remember what happened and you were young but made me angry with all this behavior, I'll make you pay for your waywardness. Didn't you just exponentially compound your outrageous obscenities with all your sluttish ways? Everyone who likes to use proverbs will use this one, like mother, like daughter. You're the daughter of your mother, who couldn't stand her husband and children. And you're a true sister of your sisters, who couldn't stand their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. Your older sister is Samaria. She lived to the north of you with her daughters. Your younger sister is Sodom, who lived to the south of you with her daughters. Haven't you lived just like they did? Haven't you engaged in outrageous obscenities just like they did? In fact, it didn't take you long to catch up and pass them. 
As sure as I am the living God, decree of God, the Master, your sister Sodom and her daughters never even came close to what you and your daughters have done. The sin of your sister Sodom was this, she lived with her daughters in the lap of luxury, proud, gluttonous, and lazy. They ignored the oppressed and the poor. They put on airs and lived obscene lives. And you know what happened, I did away with them. And Samaria. Samaria didn't sin half as much as you. You've committed far more obscenities than she ever did. Why, you make your two sisters look good in comparison with what you've done. Face it, your sisters look mighty good compared with you. Because you've out them so completely, you've actually made them look righteous. Aren't you ashamed? But you're going to have to live with it. What a reputation to carry into history, out your two sisters. But I'm going to reverse their fortunes, the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters. And, get this, your fortunes right along with them. Still, you're going to have to live with your shame. And by facing and accepting your shame, you're going to provide some comfort to your two sisters. Your sisters, Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters, will become what they were before, and you will become what you were before. Remember the days when you were putting on airs, acting so high and mighty, looking down on sister Sodom? That was before your evil ways were exposed. And now you're the butt of contempt, despised by the Edomite women, the Philistine women, and everybody else around. But you have to face it, to accept the shame of your obscene and vile life. Decree of God, the Master. God, the Master, says, I'll do to you just as you have already done, you who have treated my oath with contempt and broken the covenant. All the same, I'll remember the covenant I made with you when you were young and I'll make a new covenant with you that will last forever. You'll remember your sorry past and be properly contrite when you receive back your sisters, both the older and the younger. I'll give them to you as daughters, but not as participants in your covenant. I'll firmly establish my covenant with you and you'll know that I am God. You'll remember your past life and face the shame of it, but when I make atonement for you, make everything right after all you've done, it will leave you speechless. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, make a riddle for the house of Israel. Tell them a story. Say, God, the Master, says. A great eagle. With a huge wingspan and long feathers. In full plumage and bright colors. Came to Lebanon and took the top off a cedar, broke off the top branch, took it to a land of traders, and set it down in a city of shopkeepers. Then he took a cutting from the land, and planted it in good, well-watered soil, like a willow on a river bank. It sprouted into a flourishing vine, low to the ground, its branches grew toward the eagle, and the roots became established, a vine putting out shoots, developing branches. There was another great eagle, with a huge wingspan and thickly feathered. This vine sent out its roots toward him, from the place where it was planted. Its branches reached out to him, so he could water it from a long distance. It had been planted in good, well-watered soil, and it put out branches and bore fruit, and became a noble vine. God, the Master, says, Will it thrive? Won't he just pull it up by the roots, and leave the grapes to rot? 
and the branches to shrivel up. A withered, dead vine. It won't take much strength. Or many hands to pull it up. Even if it's transplanted. Will it thrive? When the hot east wind strikes it. Won't it shrivel up? Won't it dry up and blow away? From the place where it was planted. God's message came to me, tell this house of rebels, do you get it? Do you know what this means? Tell them, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took its king and its leaders back to Babylon. He took one of the royal family and made a covenant with him, making him swear his loyalty. The king of Babylon took all the top leaders into exile to make sure that this kingdom stayed weak, didn't get any big ideas of itself, and kept the covenant with him so that it would have a future. But he rebelled and sent emissaries to Egypt to recruit horses and a big army. Do you think that's going to work? Are they going to get by with this? Does anyone break a covenant and get off scot-free? As sure as I am the living God, this king who broke his pledge of loyalty and his covenant will die in that country, in Babylon. Pharaoh with his big army, all those soldiers, won't lift a finger to fight for him when Babylon sets siege to the city and kills everyone inside. Because he broke his word and broke the covenant, even though he gave his solemn promise, because he went ahead and did all these things anyway, he won't escape. Therefore, God, the Master, says, As sure as I am the living God, because the King despised my oath and broke my covenant, I'll bring the consequences crashing down on his head. I'll send out a search party and catch him. I'll take him to Babylon and have him brought to trial because of his total disregard for me. All his elite soldiers, along with the rest of the army, will be killed in battle, and whoever is left will be scattered to the four winds. Then you'll realize that I, God, have spoken. God, the Master, says, I personally will take a shoot from the top of the towering cedar, a cutting from the crown of the tree, and plant it on a high and towering mountain, on the high mountain of Israel. It will grow, putting out branches and fruit, a majestic cedar. Birds of every sort and kind will live under it. They'll build nests in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will recognize that I, God, made the great tree small and the small tree great, made the green tree turn dry and the dry tree sprout green branches. I, God, said it, and I did it. God's message to me. What do you people mean by going around the country repeating the saying? The parents ate green apples. The children got the stomachache. As sure as I'm the living God, you're not going to repeat this saying in Israel any longer. Every soul, man, woman, child, belongs to me, parent and child alike. You die for your own sin, not another's. Imagine a person who lives well, treating others fairly, keeping good relationships. Doesn't eat at the pagan shrines. Doesn't worship the idols so popular in Israel. Doesn't seduce a neighbor's spouse. Doesn't indulge in casual sex. Doesn't bully anyone. Doesn't pile up bad debts. Doesn't steal doesn't refuse food to the hungry, doesn't refuse clothing to the ill-clad, doesn't exploit the poor, doesn't live by impulse and greed, doesn't treat one person better than another, but lives by my statutes and faithfully, honors and obeys my laws. This person who lives upright and well, shall live a full and true life. Decree of God, the Master. But if this person has a child who turns violent and murders and goes off and does any of these things, even though the parent has done none of them. 
eats at the pagan shrines, seduces his neighbor's spouse, bullies the weak, steals, piles up bad debts, admires idols, commits outrageous obscenities, exploits the poor. Do you think this person, the child, will live? Not a chance. Because he's done all these vile things, he'll die. And his death will be his own fault. Now look, suppose that this child has a child who sees all the sins done by his parent. The child sees them, but doesn't follow in the parent's footsteps. Doesn't eat at the pagan shrines. Doesn't worship the popular idols of Israel. Doesn't seduce his neighbor's spouse. Doesn't bully anyone. Doesn't refuse to loan money. Doesn't steal. Doesn't refuse food to the hungry. Doesn't refuse to give clothes to the ill-clad. Doesn't live by impulse and greed. Doesn't exploit the poor. He does what I say. He performs my laws and lives by my statutes. This person will not die for the sins of the parent, he will live truly and well. But the parent will die for what the parent did, for the sins of oppressing the weak, robbing brothers and sisters, doing what is dead wrong in the community. Do you need to ask, so why does the child not share the guilt of the parent? Isn't it plain? It's because the child did what is fair and right. Since the child was careful to do what is lawful and right, the child will live truly and well. The soul that sins is the soul that dies. The child does not share the guilt of the parent, nor the parent the guilt of the child. If you live upright and well, you get the credit, if you live a wicked life, you're guilty as charged. But a wicked person who turns his back on that life of sin and keeps all my statutes, living a just and righteous life, he'll live, really live. He won't die. I won't keep a list of all the things he did wrong. He will live. Do you think I take any pleasure in the death of wicked men and women? Isn't it my pleasure that they turn around, no longer living wrong but living right, really living? The same thing goes for a good person who turns his back on an upright life and starts sinning, plunging into the same vile obscenities that the wicked person practices. Will this person live? I don't keep a list of all the things this person did right, like money in the bank he can draw on. Because of his defection, because he accumulates sin, he'll die. Do I hear you saying, that's not fair? God's not fair. Listen, Israel. I'm not fair. You're the ones who aren't fair. If a good person turns away from his good life and takes up sinning, he'll die for it. He'll die for his own sin. Likewise, if a bad person turns away from his bad life and starts living a good life, a fair life, he will save his life. Because he faces up to all the wrongs he's committed and puts them behind him, he will live, really live. He won't die. And yet Israel keeps on whining, that's not fair. God's not fair. I'm not fair, Israel. You're the ones who aren't fair. The upshot is this, Israel, I'll judge each of you according to the way you live. So turn around. Turn your backs on your rebellious living so that sin won't drag you down. Clean house. No more rebellions, please. Get a new heart. Get a new spirit. Why would you choose to die, Israel? I take no pleasure in anyone's death. Decree of God, the Master. Make a clean break. Live. 
Sing the blues over the princes of Israel. Say. What a lioness was your mother. Among lions. She crouched in a pride of young lions. Her cubs grew large. She reared one of her cubs to maturity. A robust young lion. He learned to hunt. He ate men. Nations sounded the alarm. He was caught in a trap. They took him with hooks. And dragged him to Egypt. When the lioness saw she was luckless. That her hope for that cub was gone. She took her other cub. And made him a strong young lion. He prowled with the lions. A robust young lion. He learned to hunt. He ate men. He rampaged through their defenses. Left their cities in ruins. The country and everyone in it. Was terrorized by the roars of the lion. The nations got together to hunt him. Everyone joined the hunt. They set out their traps. And caught him. They put a wooden collar on him. And took him to the king of Babylon. No more would that voice be heard. Disturbing the peace in the mountains of Israel. Here's another way to put it. Your mother was like a vine in a vineyard. Transplanted alongside streams of water. Luxurious in branches and grapes. Because of the ample water. It grew sturdy branches. Fit to be carved into a royal scepter. It grew high, reaching into the clouds. Its branches filled the horizon. And everyone could see it. Then it was ripped up in a rage. And thrown to the ground. The hot east wind shriveled it up. And stripped its fruit. The sturdy branches dried out. Fit for nothing but kindling. Now it's a stick stuck out in the desert. A bare stick in a desert of death. Good for nothing but making fires. Campfires in the desert. Not a hint now of those sturdy branches. Fit for use as a royal scepter. In the seventh year, the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, some of the leaders of Israel came to ask for guidance from God. They sat down before me. Then God's message came to me, Son of man, talk with the leaders of Israel. Tell them, God, the Master, says, Have you come to ask me questions? As sure as I am the living God, I'll not put up with questions from you. Decree of God, the Master. Son of man, why don't you do it? Yes, go ahead. Hold them accountable. Confront them with the outrageous obscenities of their parents. Tell them that God, the Master, says. On the day I chose Israel, I revealed myself to them in the country of Egypt, raising my hand in a solemn oath to the people of Jacob, in which I said, I am God, your personal God. On the same day that I raised my hand in the solemn oath, I promised them that I would take them out of the country of Egypt and bring them into a country that I had searched out just for them, a country flowing with milk and honey, a jewel of a country. At that time I told them, get rid of all the vile things that you've become addicted to. Don't make yourselves filthy with the Egyptian no-god idols. I alone am God, your God. But they rebelled against me, wouldn't listen to a word I said. None got rid of the vile things they were addicted to. They held on to the no-gods of Egypt as if for dear life. I seriously considered inflicting my anger on them in force right there in Egypt. Then I thought better of it. I acted out of who I was, not by how I felt. And I acted in a way that would evoke honor, not blasphemy, from the nations around them, 
nations who had seen me reveal myself by promising to lead my people out of Egypt. And then I did it, I led them out of Egypt into the desert. I gave them laws for living, showed them how to live well and obediently before me. I also gave them my weekly holy rest days, my Sabbaths, a kind of signpost erected between me and them to show them that I, God, am in the business of making them holy. But Israel rebelled against me in the desert. They didn't follow my statutes. They despised my laws for living well and obediently in the ways I had set out. And they totally desecrated my holy Sabbaths. I seriously considered unleashing my anger on them right there in the desert. But I thought better of it and acted out of who I was, not by what I felt, so that I might be honored and not blasphemed by the nations who had seen me bring them out. But I did lift my hand in a solemn oath there in the desert and promised them that I would not bring them into the country flowing with milk and honey that I had chosen for them, that jewel among all lands. I cancelled my promise because they despised my laws for living obediently, wouldn't follow my statutes, and went ahead and desecrated my holy Sabbaths. They preferred living by their no-god idols. But I didn't go all the way, I didn't wipe them out, didn't finish them off in the desert. Then I addressed myself to their children in the desert, don't do what your parents did. Don't take up their practices. Don't make yourselves filthy with their no-god idols. I myself am God, your God, keep my statutes and live by my laws. Keep my Sabbaths as holy rest days, signposts between me and you, signaling that I am God, your God. But the children also rebelled against me. They neither followed my statutes nor kept my laws for living upright and well. And they desecrated my Sabbaths. I seriously considered dumping my anger on them, right there in the desert. But I thought better of it and acted out of who I was, not by what I felt, so that I might be honored and not blasphemed by the nations who had seen me bring them out. But I did lift my hand in solemn oath there in the desert, and swore that I would scatter them all over the world, disperse them every which way because they didn't keep my laws nor live by my statutes. They desecrated my Sabbaths and remained addicted to the no-god idols of their parents. Since they were determined to live bad lives, I myself gave them statutes that could not produce goodness and laws that did not produce life. I abandoned them. Filthy in the gutter, they perversely sacrificed their firstborn children in the fire. The very horror should have shocked them into recognizing that I am God. Therefore, speak to Israel, son of man. Tell them that God says, as if that wasn't enough, your parents further insulted me by betraying me. When I brought them into that land that I had solemnly promised with my upraised hand to give them, every time they saw a hill with a sex and religion shrine on it or a grove of trees where the sacred whores practiced, they were there, buying into the whole pagan system. I said to them, what hill do you go to? It's still called Whore Hills. Therefore, say to Israel, the message of God, the Master, you're making your lives filthy by copying the ways of your parents. In repeating their vile practices, you've become whores yourselves. In burning your children as sacrifices, you've become as filthy as your no-god idols, as recently as today. Am I going to put up with questions from people like you, Israel? As sure as I am the living God, I, God, the Master, refuse to be called into question by you. What you're secretly thinking is never going to happen. You're thinking, we're going to be like everybody else, just like the other nations. We're going to worship gods we can make and control. As sure as I am the living God, says God, the Master, think again. 
With a mighty show of strength and a terrifying rush of anger, I will be king over you. I'll bring you back from the nations, collect you out of the countries to which you've been scattered, with a mighty show of strength and a terrifying rush of anger. I'll bring you to the desert of nations and haul you into court, where you'll be face to face with judgment. As I faced your parents with judgment in the desert of Egypt, so I'll face you with judgment. I'll scrutinize and search every person as you arrive, and I'll bring you under the bond of the covenant. I'll call out the rebels and traitors. I'll lead them out of their exile, but I won't bring them back to Israel. Then you'll realize that I am God. But you, people of Israel, this is the message of God, the Master, to you, go ahead, serve your no-God idols. But later, you'll think better of it and quit throwing filth and mud on me with your pagan offerings and no-God idols. For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, I, God, the Master, tell you that the entire people of Israel will worship me. I'll receive them there with open arms. I'll demand your best gifts and offerings, all your holy sacrifices. What's more, I'll receive you as the best kind of offerings when I bring you back from all the lands and countries in which you've been scattered. I'll demonstrate in the eyes of the world that I am the Holy. When I return you to the land of Israel, the land that I solemnly promised with upraised arm to give to your parents, you'll realize that I am God. Then and there you'll remember all that you've done, the way you've lived that has made you so filthy, and you'll loathe yourselves. But, dear Israel, you'll also realize that I am God when I respond to you out of who I am, not by what I feel about the evil lives you've lived, the corrupt history you've compiled. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, Son of Man, face south. Let the message roll out against the south. Prophesy against the wilderness forest of the south. Tell the forest of the south, listen to the message of God. God, the Master, says, I'll set a fire in you that will burn up every tree, dead trees and live trees alike. Nobody will put out the fire. The whole country from south to north will be blackened by it. Everyone is going to see that I, God, started the fire and that it's not going to be put out. And I said, Oh God, everyone is saying of me, he just makes up stories. God's message came to me, Son of Man, now face Jerusalem and let the message roll out against the sanctuary. Prophesy against the land of Israel. Say, God's message, I'm against you. I'm pulling my sword from its sheath and killing both the wicked and the righteous. Because I'm treating everyone the same, good and bad, Everyone from south to north is going to feel my sword. Everyone will know that I mean business. So, son of man, groan. Double up in pain. Make a scene. When they ask you, why all this groaning, this carrying on, say, because of the news that's coming. It'll knock the breath out of everyone. Hearts will stop cold knees turned to rubber. Yes, it's coming. No stopping it. Decree of God, the Master. God's message to me, son of man, prophesy. Tell them, the Master says. A sword. A sword. Razor sharp and polished. Sharpened to kill. Polished to flash like lightning. My child, you've despised the scepter of Judah. By worshipping every tree idol. The sword is made to glisten. To be held and brandished. It's sharpened and polished. Ready to be brandished by the killer. Yell out and wail, son of man. The sword is against my people. 
the princes of Israel, and my people, abandoned to the sword. Wring your hands. Tear out your hair. Testing comes. Why have you despised discipline? You can't get around it. Decree of God, the Master. So, prophesy, son of man. Clap your hands. Get their attention. Tell them that the sword's coming down. Once, twice, three times. It's a sword to kill. A sword for a massacre. A sword relentless. A sword inescapable. People collapsing right and left. Going down like dominoes. I've stationed a murderous sword. At every gate in the city. Flashing like lightning. Brandished murderously. Cut to the right, thrust to the left. Murderous, sharp-edged sword. Then I'll clap my hands. A signal that my anger is spent. I, God, have spoken. God's message came to me, Son of Man, lay out two roads for the sword of the king of Babylon to take. Start them from the same place. Place a signpost at the beginning of each road. Post one sign to mark the road of the sword to Rabbah of the Ammonites. Post the other to mark the road to Judah and Fort Jerusalem. The king of Babylon stands at the fork in the road and he decides by divination which of the two roads to take. He draws straws, he throws god dice, he examines a goat liver. He opens his right hand, the omen says, head for Jerusalem. So he's on his way with battering rams, roused to kill, sounding the battle cry, pounding down city gates, building siege works. To the Judah leaders, who themselves have sworn oaths, it will seem like a false divination, but he will remind them of their guilt, and so they'll be captured. So this is what God, the Master, says, because your sin is now out in the open so everyone can see what you've been doing, you'll be taken captive. O Zedekiah, blasphemous and evil prince of Israel, time's up. It's punishment payday. God says, take your royal crown off your head. No more business as usual. The underdog will be promoted and the top dog will be demoted. Ruins, ruins, ruins. I'll turn the whole place into ruins. And ruins it will remain until the one comes who has a right to it. Then I'll give it to him. But, son of man, your job is to prophesy. Tell them, this is the message from God, the Master, against the Ammonites and against their cruel taunts. A sword. A sword. Bared to kill. Sharp as a razor. Flashing like lightning. Despite false sword propaganda. Circulated in Ammon. The sword will sever Ammonite necks. For whom it's punishment payday. Return the sword to the sheath. I'll judge you in your home country. In the land where you grew up. I'll empty out my wrath on you. Breathe hot anger down your neck. I'll give you to vicious men. Skilled in torture. You'll end up as stovewood. Corpses will litter your land. Not so much as a memory will be left of you. I, God, have said so. God's message came to me, Son of man, are you going to judge this bloody city or not? Come now, are you going to judge her? Do it. Face her with all her outrageous obscenities. Tell her, this is what God, the Master, says, you're a city murderess at the core, just asking for punishment. You're a city obsessed with no god idols, making yourself filthy. In all your killing, 
you've piled up guilt. In all your idol making, you've become filthy. You've forced a premature end to your existence. I'll put you on exhibit as the scarecrow of the nations, the world's worst joke. From far and near they'll deride you as infamous in filth, notorious for chaos. Your leaders, the princes of Israel among you, compete in crime. You're a community that's insolent to parents, abusive to outsiders, oppressive against orphans and widows. You treat my holy things with contempt and desecrate my Sabbaths. You have people spreading lies and spilling blood, flocking to the hills to the sex shrines and fornicating unrestrained. Incest is common. Men force themselves on women regardless of whether they're ready or willing. Sex is now anarchy. Anyone is fair game, neighbor, daughter-in-law, sister. Murder is for hire, usury is rampant, extortion is commonplace. And you've forgotten me. Decree of God, the Master. Now look. I've clapped my hands, calling everyone's attention to your rapacious greed and your bloody brutalities. Can you stick with it? Will you be able to keep at this once I start dealing with you? I, God, have spoken. I'll put an end to this. I'll throw you to the four winds. I'll scatter you all over the world. I'll put a full stop to your filthy living. You will be defiled, spattered with your own mud in the eyes of the nations. And you'll recognize that I am God. God's message came to me, son of man, the people of Israel are slag to me, the useless byproduct of refined copper, tin, iron, and lead left at the smelter, a worthless slag heap. So tell them, God, the master, has spoken, because you've all become worthless slag, you're on notice, I'll assemble you in Jerusalem. As men gather silver, copper, iron, lead, and tin into a furnace and blow fire on it to melt it down, so in my wrath I'll gather you and melt you down. I'll blow on you with the fire of my wrath to melt you down in the furnace. As silver is melted down, you'll be melted down. That should get through to you. Then you'll recognize that I, God, have let my wrath loose on you. God's message came to me, son of man, tell her, you're a land that during the time I was angry with you got no rain, not so much as a spring shower. The leaders among you became desperate, like roaring, ravaging lions killing indiscriminately. They grabbed and looted, leaving widows in their wake. Your priests violated my law and desecrated my holy things. They can't tell the difference between sacred and secular. They tell people there's no difference between right and wrong. They're contemptuous of my holy Sabbaths, profaning me by trying to pull me down to their level. Your politicians are like wolves prowling and killing and rapaciously taking whatever they want. Your preachers cover up for the politicians by pretending to have received visions and special revelations. They say, this is what God, the Master, says when God hasn't said so much as one word. Extortion is rife, robbery is epidemic, the poor and needy are abused, outsiders are kicked around at will, with no access to justice. I looked for someone to stand up for me against all this, to repair the defenses of the city, to take a stand for me and stand in the gap to protect this land so I wouldn't have to destroy it. I couldn't find anyone. Not one. So I'll empty out my wrath on them, burn them to a crisp with my hot anger, serve them with the consequences of all they've done. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, son of man, there were two women, daughters of the same mother. They became whores in Egypt, whores from a young age. Their breasts were fondled, 
their young bosoms caressed. The older sister was named Ohola, the younger was Ohalaba. They were my daughters, and they gave birth to sons and daughters. Ohola is Samaria and Ohalaba is Jerusalem. Ohola started whoring while she was still mine. She lusted after Assyrians as lovers, military men smartly uniformed in blue, ambassadors and governors, good-looking young men mounted on fine horses. Her lust was unrestrained. She was a whore to the Assyrian elite. She compounded her filth with the idols of those to whom she gave herself in lust. She never slowed down. The whoring she began while young in Egypt she continued, sleeping with men who played with her breasts and spent their lust on her. So I left her to her Assyrian lovers, for whom she was so obsessed with lust. They ripped off her clothes, took away her children, and then, the final indignity, killed her. Among women her name became shame, history's judgment on her. Her sister Ohalaba saw all this, but she became even worse than her sister in lust and whoring, if you can believe it. She also went crazy with lust for Assyrians, ambassadors and governors, military men smartly dressed and mounted on fine horses, the Assyrian elite. And I saw that she also had become incredibly filthy. Both women followed the same path. But Ohalaba surpassed her sister. When she saw figures of Babylonians carved in relief on the walls and painted red, fancy belts around their waists, elaborate turbans on their heads, all of them looking important, famous Babylonians, she went wild with lust and sent invitations to them in Babylon. The Babylonians came on the run, fornicated with her, made her dirty inside and out. When they had thoroughly debased her, she lost interest in them. Then she went public with her fornication. She exhibited her sex to the world. I turned my back on her just as I had on her sister. But that didn't slow her down. She went at her whoring harder than ever. She remembered when she was young, just starting out as a whore in Egypt. That whetted her appetite for more virile, vulgar, and violent lovers, stallions obsessive in their lust. She longed for the sexual prowess of her youth back in Egypt, where her firm young breasts were caressed and fondled. Therefore, O Halibah, this is the message from God, the Master, I will incite your old lovers against you, lovers you got tired of and left in disgust. I'll bring them against you from every direction, Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekot, Shoah, and Koah, and all Assyrians, good-looking young men, ambassadors and governors, elite officers and celebrities, all of them mounted on fine, spirited horses. They'll come down on you out of the north, armed to the teeth, bringing chariots and troops from all sides. I'll turn over the task of judgment to them. They'll punish you according to their rules. I'll stand totally and relentlessly against you as they rip into you furiously. They'll mutilate you, cutting off your ears and nose, killing at random. They'll enslave your children, and anybody left over will be burned. They'll rip off your clothes and steal your jewelry. I'll put a stop to your sluttish sex, the whoring life you began in Egypt. You won't look on whoring with fondness anymore. You won't think back on Egypt with stars in your eyes. A message from God, the Master, I'm at the point of abandoning you to those you hate, to those by whom you're repulsed. They'll treat you hatefully, leave you publicly naked, your whore's body exposed in the cruel glare of the sun. Your sluttish lust will be exposed. Your lust has brought you to this condition because you whored with pagan nations and made yourself filthy with their no-god idols. You copied the life of your sister. Now I'll let you drink the cup she drank. 
This is the message of God, the Master. You'll drink your sister's cup. A cup canyon deep and ocean wide. You'll be shunned and taunted. As you drink from that cup, full to the brim. You'll be falling down drunk and the tears will flow. As you drink from that cup titanic with terror. It's the cup of your sister Samaria. You'll drink it dry. Then smash it to bits and eat the pieces. And end up tearing at your breasts. I've given the word. Decree of God, the Master. Therefore God, the Master, says, because you've forgotten all about me, pushing me into the background, you now must pay for what you've done, pay for your sluttish sex and whoring life. Then God said to me, Son of man, will you confront Ohola and Ohalaba with what they've done? Make them face their outrageous obscenities, obscenities ranging from adultery to murder. They committed adultery with their no-god idols, sacrificed the children they bore me in order to feed their idols. And there is also this, they've defiled my holy sanctuary and desecrated my holy sabbaths. The same day that they sacrificed their children to their idols, they walked into my sanctuary and defiled it. That's what they did, in my house. Furthermore, they even sent out invitations by special messenger to men far away, and, sure enough, they came. They bathed themselves, put on makeup and provocative lingerie. They reclined on a sumptuous bed, aromatic with incense and oils, my incense and oils. The crowd gathered, jostling and pushing, a drunken rabble. They adorned the sisters with bracelets on their arms and tiaras on their heads. I said, she's burned out on sex, but that didn't stop them. They kept banging on her doors night and day as men do when they're after a whore. That's how they used Ohola and Ohalaba, the worn-out whores. Righteous men will pronounce judgment on them, giving out sentences for adultery and murder. That was their life work, adultery and murder. God says, let a mob loose on them, terror. Plunder. Let the mob stone them and hack them to pieces, kill all their children, burn down their houses. I'll put an end to sluttish sex in this country so that all women will be well warned and not copy you. You'll pay the price for all your obsessive sex. You'll pay in full for your promiscuous affairs with idols. And you'll realize that I am God, the Master. The message of God came to me in the ninth year, the tenth month, and the tenth day of the month, Son of Man, write down this date. The King of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Tell this company of rebels a story. Put on the soup pot. Fill it with water. Put chunks of meat into it. All the choice pieces, loin and brisket. Pick out the best soup bones. From the best of the sheep in the flock. Pile wood beneath the pot. Bring it to a boil. And cook the soup. God, the Master, says. Doomed to the city of murder. To the pot thick with scum. Thick with a filth that can't be scoured. Empty the pot piece by piece. Don't bother who gets what. The blood from murders. Has stained the whole city. Blood runs bold on the street stones. With no one bothering to wash it off. Blood out in the open to public view. To provoke my wrath. To trigger my vengeance. Therefore, this is what God, the Master, says. Doomed to the city of murder. I, too, will pile on the wood. Stack the wood high. Light the match. Cook the meat, spice it well, 
pour out the broth. And then burn the bones. Then I'll set the empty pot on the coals. And heat it red hot so the bronze glows. So the germs are killed. And the corruption is burned off. But it's hopeless. It's too far gone. The filth is too thick. Your encrusted filth is your filthy sex. I wanted to clean you up, but you wouldn't let me. I'll make no more attempts at cleaning you up until my anger quiets down. I, God, have said it, and I'll do it. I'm not holding back. I've run out of compassion. I'm not changing my mind. You're getting exactly what's coming to you. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, Son of Man, I'm about to take from you the delight of your life, a real blow, I know. But, please, no tears. Keep your grief to yourself. No public mourning. Get dressed as usual and go about your work, none of the usual funeral rituals. I preach to the people in the morning. That evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I'd been told. The people came to me, saying, tell us why you're acting like this. What does it mean, anyway? So I told them, God's word came to me, saying, tell the family of Israel, this is what God, the Master, says, I will desecrate my sanctuary, your proud impregnable fort, the delight of your life, your heart's desire. The children you left behind will be killed. Then you'll do exactly as I've done. You'll perform none of the usual funeral rituals. You'll get dressed as usual and go about your work. No tears. But your sins will eat away at you from within and you'll groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be your example. The way he did it is the way you'll do it. When this happens you'll recognize that I am God, the Master. And you, son of man, the day I take away the people's refuge, their great joy, the delight of their life, what they've most longed for, along with all their children, on that very day a survivor will arrive and tell you what happened to the city. You'll break your silence and start talking again, talking to the survivor. Again, you'll be an example for them. And they'll recognize that I am God. God's message came to me. Son of man, face Ammon and preach against the people, listen to the message of God, the Master. This is what God has to say, because you cheered when my sanctuary was desecrated and the land of Judah was devastated and the people of Israel were taken into exile, I'm giving you over to the people of the east. They'll move in and make themselves at home eating the food right off your tables and drinking your milk. I'll turn your capital, Rabba, into pasture for camels and all your villages into corrals for flocks. Then you'll realize that I am God. God, the Master, says, because you clapped and cheered, venting all your malicious contempt against the land of Israel, I'll step in and hand you out as loot, first come, first served. I'll cross you off the roster of nations. There'll be nothing left of you. And you'll realize that I am God. God, the Master, says, because Moab said, Look, Judah's nothing special, I'll lay wide open the flank of Moab by exposing its lovely frontier villages to attack, Beth Jeshemoth, Balmian, and Kiriathane. I'll lump Moab in with Ammon and give them to the people of the east for the taking. Ammon won't be heard from again. I'll punish Moab severely. And they'll realize that I am God. God, the Master, says, because Edom reacted against the people of Judah in spiteful revenge and was so criminally vengeful against them, therefore I, God, the Master, will oppose Edom and kill the lot of them, 
people and animals both. I'll waste it, corpses stretched from Taman to Dedan. I'll use my people Israel to bring my vengeance down on Edom. My wrath will fuel their action. And they'll realize it's my vengeance. Decree of God the Master God, the Master, says, because the Philistines were so spitefully vengeful, all those centuries of stored up malice, and did their best to destroy Judah, therefore I, God, the Master, will oppose the Philistines and cut down the Cretans and anybody else left along the seacoast. Huge Acts of Vengeance, Massive Punishments When I bring vengeance, they'll realize that I am God. In the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, God's message came to me, Son of Man, Tyre cheered when they got the news of Jerusalem, exclaiming, Good! The gateway city is smashed. Now all her business comes my way. She's in ruins. And I'm in clover. Therefore, God, the Master, has this to say. I'm against you, Tyre. And I'll bring many nations surging against you. As the waves of the sea surging against the shore. They'll smash the city walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I'll wash away the soil, and leave nothing but bare rock. She'll be an island of bare rock in the ocean, good for nothing but drying fishnets. Yes, I've said so. Decree of God, the Master. She'll be loot, free pickings for the nations. Her surrounding villages will be butchered. Then they'll realize that I am God. God, the Master, says, Look! Out of the north I'm bringing Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, a king's king, down on Tyre. He'll come with chariots and horses and riders, a huge army. He'll massacre your surrounding villages and lay siege to you. He'll build siege ramps against your walls. A forest of shields will advance against you. He'll pummel your walls with his battering rams and shatter your towers with his iron weapons. You'll be covered with dust from his horde of horses, a thundering herd of war horses pouring through the breaches, pulling chariots. Oh, it will be an earthquake of an army and a city in shock. Horses will stampede through the streets. Your people will be slaughtered and your huge pillars strewn like matchsticks. The invaders will steal and loot, all that wealth, all that stuff. They'll knock down your fine houses and dump the stone and timber rubble into the sea. And your parties, your famous good time parties, will be no more. No more songs, no more lutes. I'll reduce you to an island of bare rock, good for nothing but drying fishnets. You'll never be rebuilt. I, God, have said so. Decree of God, the Master. This is the message of God, the Master, to Tyre, won't the ocean islands shake at the crash of your collapse, at the groans of your wounded, at your mayhem and massacre? All up and down the coast, the princes will come down from their thrones, take off their royal robes and fancy clothes, and wrap themselves in sheer terror. They'll sit on the ground, shaken to the core, horrified at you. Then they'll begin chanting a funeral song over you. Sunk. Sunk to the bottom of the sea. Famous city on the sea. Power of the seas. You and your people. Intimidating everyone who lived in your shadows. But now the islands are shaking. At the sound of your crash. Ocean islands in tremors. From the impact of your fall. The message of God, the Master, when I turn you into a wasted city, a city empty of people, a ghost town, and when I bring up the great ocean deeps and cover you, 
then I'll push you down among those who go to the grave, the long, long dead. I'll make you live there, in the grave in old ruins, with the buried dead. You'll never see the land of the living again. I'll introduce you to the terrors of death and that'll be the end of you. They'll send out search parties for you, but you'll never be found. Decree of God, the Master God's message came to me, you, son of man, raise a funeral song over Tyre. Tell Tyre, gateway to the sea, merchant to the world, traitor among the far-off islands, this is what God, the Master, says. You boast, Tyre. I'm the perfect ship, stately, handsome. You ruled the high seas from. A real beauty, crafted to perfection. Your planking came from. Mount Hermon Junipers. A Lebanon cedar. Supplied your mast. They made your oars. From sturdy Bayesian oaks. Cypress from Cyprus inlaid with ivory. Was used for the decks. Your sail and flag were of colorful. Embroidered linen from Egypt. Your purple deck awnings. Also came from Cyprus. Men of Sidon and Arvad pulled the oars. Your seasoned seamen, O Tyre, were the crew. Ships carpenters. Were old salts from Byblos. All the ships of the sea and their sailors. Clustered around you to barter for your goods. Your army was composed of soldiers. From Paras, Lud, and Put. Elite troops in uniform splendor. They put you on the map. Your city police were imported from. Arvad, Helek, and Gammad. They hung their shields from the city walls. A final, perfect touch to your beauty. Tarshish carried on business with you because of your great wealth. They worked for you, trading in silver, iron, tin, and lead for your products. Greece, Tubal, and Meshech did business with you, trading slaves and bronze for your products. Beth Tagarma traded workhorses, war horses, and mules for your products. The people of Rhodes did business with you. Many far-off islands traded with you in ivory and ebony. Edom did business with you because of all your goods. They traded for your products with agate, purple textiles, embroidered cloth, fine linen, coral, and rubies. Judah and Israel did business with you. They traded for your products with premium wheat, millet, honey, oil, and balm. Damascus, attracted by your vast array of products and well-stocked warehouses, carried on business with you, trading in wine from Helbon and wool from Zahar. Danites and Greeks from Yuzel traded with you, using wrought iron, cinnamon, and spices. Dedan traded with you for saddle blankets. Arabia and all the Bedouin sheiks of Kedar traded lambs, rams, and goats with you. Traders from Sheba and Rama in South Arabia carried on business with you in premium spices, precious stones, and gold. Haran, Cana, and Eden from the east in Assyria and Media traded with you, bringing elegant clothes, dyed textiles, and elaborate carpets to your bazaars. The great Tarshish ships were your freighters, importing and exporting. Oh, it was big business for you, trafficking the seaways. Your sailors row mightily, taking you into the high seas. Then a storm out of the east shatters your ship in the ocean deep. Everything sinks, your rich goods and products. Sailors and crew, ships carpenters and soldiers sink to the bottom of the sea total shipwreck. The cries of your sailors. 
reverberate on shore. Sailors everywhere abandon ship. Veteran seamen swim for dry land. They cry out in grief. A choir of bitter lament over you. They smear their faces with ashes. Shave their heads. Wear rough burlap. Wildly keening their loss. They raise their funeral song. Who on the high seas is like Tyre? As you crisscrossed the seas with your products. You satisfied many peoples. Your worldwide trade. Made earth's kings rich. And now you're battered to bits by the waves. Sunk to the bottom of the sea. And everything you've bought and sold. Has sunk to the bottom with you. Everyone on shore looks on in terror. The hair of kings stands on end. Their faces drawn and haggard. The buyers and sellers of the world. Throw up their hands. This horror can't happen. Oh, this has happened. God's message came to me, son of man, tell the prince of Tyre, this is what God, the master, says. Your heart is proud. Going around saying, I'm a God. I sit on God's divine throne. Ruling the sea. You, a mere mortal. Not even close to being a God. A mere mortal. Trying to be a God. Look, you think you're smarter than Daniel. No enigmas can stump you. Your sharp intelligence. Made you world wealthy. You piled up gold and silver. In your banks. You used your head well. Worked good deals, made a lot of money. But the money has gone to your head. Swelled your head, what a big head. Therefore, God, the Master, says. Because you're acting like a God. Pretending to be a God. I'm giving fair warning, I'm bringing strangers down on you. The most vicious of all nations. They'll pull their swords and make hash. Of your reputation for knowing it all. They'll puncture the balloon. Of your God pretensions. They'll bring you down from your self-made pedestal. And bury you in the deep blue sea. Will you protest to your assassins? You can't do that. I'm a god. To them you're a mere mortal. They're killing a man, not a god. You'll die like a stray dog. Killed by strangers. Because I said so. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, son of man, raise a funeral song over the king of Tyre. Tell him, a message from God, the Master. You had everything going for you. You were in Eden, God's garden. You were dressed in splendor. Your robe studded with jewels. Carnelian, Peridot, and Moonstone. Beryl, Onyx, and Jasper. Sapphire, Turquoise, and Emerald. All in settings of engraved gold. A robe was prepared for you. The same day you were created. You were the anointed cherub. I placed you on the mountain of God. You strolled in magnificence. Among the stones of fire. From the day of your creation. You were sheer perfection. And then imperfection, evil, was detected in you. In much buying and selling. You turned violent, you sinned. I threw you, disgraced, off the mountain of God. I threw you out, you, the anointed angel cherub. No more strolling among the gems of fire for you. Your beauty went to your head. You corrupted wisdom. 
by using it to get worldly fame. I threw you to the ground. Sent you sprawling before an audience of kings. And let them gloat over your demise. By sin after sin after sin. By your corrupt ways of doing business. You defiled your holy places of worship. So I set a fire around and within you. It burned you up. I reduced you to ashes. All anyone sees now. When they look for you is ashes. A pitiful mound of ashes. All who once knew you. Now throw up their hands. This can't have happened. This has happened. God's message came to me, son of man, confront Sidon. Preach against it. Say, message from God, the Master. Look. I'm against you, Sidon. I intend to be known for who I truly am among you. They'll know that I am God. When I set things right. And reveal my holy presence. I'll order an epidemic of disease there. Along with murder and mayhem in the streets. People will drop dead right and left. As war presses in from every side. Then they'll realize that I mean business. That I am God. No longer will Israel have to put up with. Their thistle and thorn neighbors. Who have treated them so contemptuously. And they also will realize that I am God. God, the Master, says, when I gather Israel from the peoples among whom they've been scattered and put my holiness on display among them with all the nations looking on, then they'll live in their own land that I gave to my servant Jacob. They'll live there in safety. They'll build houses. They'll plant vineyards, living in safety. Meanwhile, I'll bring judgment on all the neighbors who have treated them with such contempt. And they'll realize that I am God. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day, God's message came to me, Son of Man, confront Pharaoh king of Egypt. Preach against him and all the Egyptians. Tell him, God, the Master, says. Watch yourself, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I'm dead set against you. You lumbering old dragon. Lolling and flax it in the Nile. Saying, it's my Nile. I made it. It's mine. I'll set hooks in your jaw. I'll make the fish of the Nile stick to your scales. I'll pull you out of the Nile. With all the fish stuck to your scales. Then I'll drag you out into the desert. You and all the Nile fish sticking to your scales. You'll lie there in the open, rotting in the sun. Meat to the wild animals and carrion birds. Everybody living in Egypt. Will realize that I am God. Because you've been a flimsy reed crutch to Israel so that when they gripped you, you splintered and cut their hand, and when they leaned on you, you broke and sent them sprawling, message of God, the Master, I'll bring war against you, do away with people and animals alike, and turn the country into an empty desert so they'll realize that I am God. Because you said, it's my Nile. I made it. It's all mine, therefore I am against you and your rivers. I'll reduce Egypt to an empty, desolate wasteland all the way from Migdal in the north to Syene and the border of Ethiopia in the south. Not a human will be seen in it, nor will an animal move through it. It'll be just empty desert, empty for forty years. I'll make Egypt the most desolate of all desolations. For forty years I'll make her cities the most wasted of all wasted cities. I'll scatter Egyptians to the four winds, send them off every which way into exile. But, says God, the Master, that's not the end of it. 
After the forty years, I'll gather up the Egyptians from all the places where they've been scattered. I'll put things back together again for Egypt. I'll bring her back to Pathros where she got her start long ago. There she'll start over again from scratch. She'll take her place at the bottom of the ladder and there she'll stay, never to climb that ladder again, never to be a world power again. Never again will Israel be tempted to rely on Egypt. All she'll be to Israel is a reminder of old sin. Then Egypt will realize that I am God, the Master. In the twenty-seventh year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, God's message came to me, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has worn out his army against Tyre. They've worked their fingers to the bone and have nothing to show for it. Therefore, God, the Master, says, I'm giving Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. He'll haul away its wealth, pick the place clean. He'll pay his army with Egyptian plunder. He's been working for me all these years without pay. This is his pay, Egypt. Decree of God, the Master. And then I'll stir up fresh hope in Israel, the dawn of deliverance, and I'll give you, Ezekiel, bold and confident words to speak. And they'll realize that I am God. God, the Master, spoke to me, Son of Man, preach. Give them the message of God, the Master. Wail. Doomsday. Time's up. God's big day of judgment is near. Thick clouds are rolling in. It's doomsday for the nations. Death will rain down on Egypt. Terror will paralyze Ethiopia. When they see the Egyptians killed, their wealth hauled off. Their foundations demolished. And Ethiopia, Put, Lud, Arabia, Libya. All of Egypt's old allies. Killed right along with them. God says. Egypt's allies will fall. And her proud strength will collapse. From Migdal in the north to Syene in the south. A great slaughter in Egypt. Decree of God, the Master. Egypt, most desolate of the desolate. Her cities wasted beyond wasting. Will realize that I am God. When I burn her down. And her helpers are knocked flat. When that happens, I'll send out messengers by ship to sound the alarm among the easygoing Ethiopians. They'll be terrorized. Egypt's doomed. Judgment's coming. God, the Master, says. I'll put a stop to Egypt's arrogance. I'll use Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon to do it. He and his army, the most brutal of nations. Shall be used to destroy the country. They'll brandish their swords and fill Egypt with corpses. I'll dry up the Nile, and sell off the land to a bunch of crooks. I'll hire outsiders to come in, and waste the country, strip it clean. I, God, have said so. And now this is what God, the Master, says. I'll smash all the no-God idols. I'll topple all those huge statues in Memphis. The prince of Egypt will be gone for good. And in his place I'll put fear, fear throughout Egypt. I'll demolish Pathros. Burn Zoan to the ground, and punish Thebes. Pour my wrath on Pelusium, Egypt's fort. And knock Thebes off its proud pedestal. I'll set Egypt on fire. Pelusium will writhe in pain. Thebes blown away. Memphis raped. The young warriors of On and Pibaseth. Will be killed and the cities exiled. 
A dark day for Topanis. When I shatter Egypt. When I break Egyptian power. And put an end to her arrogant oppression. She'll disappear in a cloud of dust. Her cities hauled off as exiles. That's how I'll punish Egypt. And that's how she'll realize that I am God. In the eleventh year, on the seventh day of the first month, God's message came to me. Son of man, I've broken the arm of Pharaoh king of Egypt. And look! It hasn't been set. No splint has been put on it so the bones can knit and heal, so he can use a sword again. Therefore, God, the Master, says, I am dead set against Pharaoh king of Egypt and will go ahead and break his other arm, both arms broken. There's no way he'll ever swing a sword again. I'll scatter Egyptians all over the world. I'll make the arms of the king of Babylon strong and put my sword in his hand, but I'll break the arms of Pharaoh and he'll groan like one who is mortally wounded. I'll make the arms of the king of Babylon strong, but the arms of Pharaoh shall go limp. The Egyptians will realize that I am God when I place my sword in the hand of the king of Babylon. He'll wield it against Egypt and I'll scatter Egyptians all over the world. Then they'll realize that I am God. In the eleventh year, on the first day of the third month, God's message came to me, Son of man, tell Pharaoh king of Egypt, that pompous old goat. Who do you, astride the world? Think you really are? Look! Assyria was a big tree, huge as a Lebanon cedar. Beautiful limbs offering cool shade. Skyscraper high. Piercing the clouds. The waters gave it drink. The primordial deep lifted it high. Gushing out rivers around. The place where it was planted. And then branching out in streams. To all the trees in the forest. It was immense dwarfing all the trees in the forest. Thick boughs, long limbs. Roots delving deep into earth's waters. All the birds of the air. Nested in its boughs. All the wild animals. Gave birth under its branches. All the mighty nations. Lived in its shade. It was stunning in its majesty the reach of its branches, the depth of its water-seeking roots. Not a cedar in God's garden came close to it. No pine tree was anything like it. Mighty oaks looked like bushes, growing alongside it. Not a tree in God's garden was in the same class of beauty. I made it beautiful, a work of art in limbs and leaves. The envy of every tree in Eden. Every last tree in God's garden. Therefore, God, the Master, says, because it skyscrapered upward, piercing the clouds, swaggering and proud of its stature, I turned it over to a world-famous leader to call its evil to account. I'd had enough. Outsiders, unbelievably brutal, felled it across the mountain ranges. Its branches were strewn through all the valleys, its leafy boughs clogging all the streams and rivers. Because its shade was gone, everybody walked off. No longer a tree, just a log. On that dead log birds perch. Wild animals burrow under it. That marks the end of the big tree nations. No more trees nourished from the great deep, no more cloud-piercing trees, no more earth-born trees taking over. They're all slated for death, back to earth, right along with men and women, for whom it's dust to dust. The message of God, the Master, on the day of the funeral of the big tree, I threw the great deep into mourning. 
I stopped the flow of its rivers, held back great seas, and wrapped the Lebanon mountains in black. All the trees of the forest fainted and fell. I made the whole world quake when it crashed, and threw it into the underworld to take its place with all else that gets buried. All the trees of Eden and the finest and best trees of Lebanon, well watered, were relieved, they had descended to the underworld with it, along with everyone who had lived in its shade and all who had been killed. Which of the trees of Eden came anywhere close to you in splendor and size? But you're slated to be cut down to take your place in the underworld with the trees of Eden, to be a dead log stacked with all the other dead logs, among the other uncircumcised who are dead and buried. This means Pharaoh, the pompous old goat. Decree of God, the Master. In the twelfth year, on the first day of the twelfth month, God's message came to me, Son of Man, sing a funeral lament over Pharaoh king of Egypt. Tell him. You think you're a young lion. Prowling through the nations. You're more like a dragon in the ocean. Snorting and thrashing about. God, the master, says. I'm going to throw my net over you. Many nations will get in on this operation and haul you out with my dragnet. I'll dump you on the ground, out in an open field, and bring in all the crows and vultures, for a sumptuous carrion lunch. I'll invite wild animals from all over the world, to gorge on your guts. I'll scatter hunks of your meat in the mountains, and strew your bones in the valleys. The country, right up to the mountains, will be drenched with your blood, your blood filling every ditch and channel. When I blot you out, I'll pull the curtain on the skies, and shut out the stars. I'll throw a cloud across the sun, and turn off the moonlight. I'll turn out every light in the sky above you and put your land in the dark. Decree of God, the Master. I'll shake up everyone worldwide. When I take you off captive to strange and far-off countries, I'll shock people with you. Kings will take one look and shudder. I'll shake my sword. And they'll shake in their boots. On the day you crash, they'll tremble thinking, that could be me. God, the Master, says. The sword of the King of Babylon is coming against you. I'll use the swords of champions to lay your pride low. Use the most brutal of nations to knock Egypt off her high horse, to puncture that hot air pomposity. I'll destroy all their livestock that graze along the river. Neither human foot nor animal hoof will muddy those waters anymore. I'll clear their springs and streams, make their rivers flow clean and smooth. Decree of God, the Master. When I turn Egypt back to the wild, and strip her clean of all her abundant produce. When I strike dead all who live there, then they'll realize that I am God. This is a funeral song. Chant it. Daughters of the nations, chant it. Chant it over Egypt for the death of its pomp. Decree of God, the Master. In the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the first month, God's message came to me. Son of man, lament over Egypt's pompous ways. Send her on her way. Dispatch Egypt and her proud daughter nations to the underworld, down to the country of the dead and buried. Say, you think you're so high and mighty. Down. 
Take your place with the heathen in that unhallowed grave. She'll be dumped in with those killed in battle. The sword is bared. Drag her off in all her proud pomp. All the big men and their helpers down among the dead and buried will greet them, welcome to the grave of the heathen. Join the ranks of the victims of war. Assyria is there and its congregation, the whole nation a cemetery. Their graves are in the deepest part of the underworld, a congregation of graves, all killed in battle, these people who terrorize the land of the living. Elam is there in all her pride, a cemetery, all killed in battle, dumped in her heathen grave with the dead and buried, these people who terrorize the land of the living. They carry their shame with them, along with the others in the grave. They turned Elam into a resort for the pompous dead, landscaped with heathen graves, slaughtered in battle. They once terrorized the land of the living. Now they carry their shame down with the others in deep earth. They're in the section set aside for the slain in battle. Meshech Tubal is there in all her pride, a cemetery in uncircumcised ground, dumped in with those slaughtered in battle, just deserts for terrorizing the land of the living. Now they carry their shame down with the others in deep earth. They're in the section set aside for the slain. They're segregated from the heroes, the old-time giants who entered the grave in full battle dress, their swords placed under their heads and their shields covering their bones, those heroes who spread terror through the land of the living. And you, Egypt, will be dumped in a heathen grave, along with all the rest, in the section set aside for the slain. Edom is there, with her kings and princes. In spite of her vaunted greatness, she is dumped in a heathen grave with the others headed for the grave. The princes of the north are there, the whole lot of them, and all the Sidonians who carry their shame to their graves, all that terror they spread with their brute power, dumped in unhallowed ground with those killed in battle, carrying their shame with the others headed for deep earth. Pharaoh will see them all and, pompous old goat that he is, take comfort in the company he'll keep, Pharaoh and his slaughtered army. Decree of God, the Master. I used him to spread terror in the land of the living and now I'm dumping him in heathen ground with those killed by the sword, Pharaoh and all his pomp. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, Son of Man, speak to your people. Tell them, if I bring war on this land and the people take one of their citizens and make him their watchman, and if the watchman sees war coming and blows the trumpet, warning the people, then if anyone hears the sound of the trumpet and ignores it and war comes and takes him off, it's his own fault. He heard the alarm, he ignored it, it's his own fault. If he had listened, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees war coming and doesn't blow the trumpet, warning the people, and war comes and takes anyone off, I'll hold the watchman responsible for the bloodshed of any unwarned sinner. You, son of man, are the watchman. I've made you a watchman for Israel. The minute you hear a message from me, warn them. If I say to the wicked, wicked man, wicked woman, you're on the fast track to death, and you don't speak up and warn the wicked to change their ways, the wicked will die unwarned in their sins and I'll hold you responsible for their bloodshed. But if you warn the wicked to change their ways and they don't do it, they'll die in their sins well warned and at least you will have saved your own life. Son of man, speak to Israel. Tell them, you've said, our rebellions and sins are weighing us down. We're wasting away. How can we go on living? Tell them, as sure as I am the living God, I take no pleasure from the death of the wicked. I want the wicked to change their ways and live. Turn your life around. Reverse your evil ways. Why die, Israel? 
There's more, son of man. Tell your people, a good person's good life won't save him when he decides to rebel, and a bad person's bad life won't prevent him from repenting of his rebellion. A good person who sins can't expect to live when he chooses to sin. It's true that I tell good people, live. Be alive. But if they trust in their good deeds and turn to evil, that good life won't amount to a hill of beans. They'll die for their evil life. On the other hand, if I tell a wicked person, you'll die for your wicked life, and he repents of his sin and starts living a righteous and just life, being generous to the down and out, restoring what he had stolen, cultivating life-nourishing ways that don't hurt others, he'll live. He won't die. None of his sins will be kept on the books. He's doing what's right, living a good life. He'll live. Your people say, the master's way isn't fair. But it's the way they're living that isn't fair. When good people turn back from living good lives and plunge into sin, they'll die for it. And when a wicked person turns away from his wicked life and starts living a just and righteous life, he'll come alive. Still, you keep on saying, the master's way isn't fair. We'll see, Israel. I'll decide on each of you exactly according to how you live. In the twelfth year of our exile, on the fifth day of the tenth month, a survivor from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city's fallen. The evening before the survivor arrived, the hand of God had been on me and restored my speech. By the time he arrived in the morning I was able to speak. I could talk again. God's message came to me, Son of man, those who are living in the ruins back in Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man and he owned the whole country. But there are lots of us. Our ownership is even more certain. So tell them, God the Master says, you eat flesh that contains blood, you worship no God idols, you murder at will, and you expect to own this land? You rely on the sword, you engage in obscenities, you indulge in sex at random, anyone, anytime. And you still expect to own this land? Tell them this, Ezekiel, the message of God, the Master. As sure as I am the living God, those who are still alive in the ruins will be killed. Anyone out in the field I'll give to wild animals for food. Anyone hiding out in mountain forts and caves will die of disease. I'll make this country an empty wasteland, no more arrogant bullying. Israel's mountains will become dangerously desolate. No one will dare pass through them. They'll realize that I am God when I devastate the country because of all the obscenities they've practiced. As for you, son of man, you've become quite the talk of the town. Your people meet on street corners and in front of their houses and say, let's go hear the latest news from God. They show up, as people tend to do, and sit in your company. They listen to you speak, but don't do a thing you say. They flatter you with compliments, but all they care about is making money and getting ahead. To them you're merely entertainment, a country singer of sad love songs, playing a guitar. They love to hear you talk, but nothing comes of it. But when all this happens, and it is going to happen, they'll realize that a prophet was among them. God's message came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherd leaders of Israel. Yes, prophesy. Tell those shepherds, God, the Master, says, Doom to you shepherds of Israel, feeding your own mouths. Aren't shepherds supposed to feed sheep? You drink the milk, you make clothes from the wool, you roast the lambs, but you don't feed the sheep. You don't build up the weak ones, don't heal the sick, don't doctor the injured, don't go after the strays, don't look for the lost. 
you bully and badger them. And now they're scattered every which way because there was no shepherd, scattered and easy pickings for wolves and coyotes. Scattered, my sheep, exposed and vulnerable across mountains and hills. My sheep scattered all over the world, and no one out looking for them. Therefore, shepherds, listen to the message of God, as sure as I am the living God, decree of God, the Master, because my sheep have been turned into mere prey, into easy meals for wolves because you shepherds ignored them and only fed yourselves, listen to what God has to say. Watch out! I'm coming down on the shepherds and taking my sheep back. They're fired as shepherds of my sheep. No more shepherds who just feed themselves. I'll rescue my sheep from their greed. They're not going to feed off my sheep any longer. God, the Master, says, from now on, I myself am the shepherd. I'm going looking for them. As shepherds go after their flocks when they get scattered, I'm going after my sheep. I'll rescue them from all the places they've been scattered to in the storms. I'll bring them back from foreign peoples, gather them from foreign countries, and bring them back to their home country. I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel, along the streams, among their own people. I'll lead them into lush pasture so they can roam the mountain pastures of Israel, graze at leisure, feed in the rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. And I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make sure they get plenty of rest. I'll go after the lost, I'll collect the strays, I'll doctor the injured, I'll build up the weak ones and oversee the strong ones so they're not exploited. And as for you, my dear flock, I'm stepping in and judging between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. Aren't you satisfied to feed in good pasture without taking over the whole place? Can't you be satisfied to drink from the clear stream without muddying the water with your feet? Why do the rest of my sheep have to make do with grass that's trampled down and water that's been muddied? Therefore, God, the Master, says, I myself am stepping in and making things right between the plump sheep and the skinny sheep. Because you forced your way with shoulder and rump and butted at all the weaker animals with your horns till you scattered them all over the hills, I'll come in and save my dear flock, no longer let them be pushed around. I'll step in and set things right between one sheep and another. I'll appoint one shepherd over them all, my servant David. He'll feed them. He'll be their shepherd. And I, God, will be their God. My servant David will be their prince. I, God, have spoken. I'll make a covenant of peace with them. I'll banish fierce animals from the country so the sheep can live safely in the wilderness and sleep in the forest. I'll make them and everything around my hill a blessing. I'll send down plenty of rain in season, showers of blessing. The trees in the orchards will bear fruit, the ground will produce, they'll feel content and safe on their land and they'll realize that I am God when I break them out of their slavery and rescue them from their slave masters. No longer will they be exploited by outsiders and ravaged by fierce beasts. They'll live safe and sound, fearless and free. I'll give them rich gardens, lavish in vegetables, no more living half-starved, no longer taunted by outsiders. They'll know, beyond doubting, that I, God, am their God, that I'm with them and that they, the people Israel, are my people. Decree of God, the Master. You are my dear flock. The flock of my pasture, my human flock. And I am your God. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, Son of Man, confront Mount Seir prophesy against it. Tell them, God, the Master, says. 
I'm coming down hard on you, Mount Seir. I'm stepping in and turning you to a pile of rubble. I'll reduce your towns to piles of rocks. There'll be nothing left of you. Then you'll realize that I am God. I'm doing this because you've kept this age-old grudge going against Israel, you viciously attacked them when they were already down, looking their final punishment in the face. Therefore, as sure as I am the living God, I'm lining you up for a real bloodbath. Since you loved blood so much, you'll be chased by rivers of blood. I'll reduce Mount Seir to a heap of rubble. No one will either come or go from that place. I'll blanket your mountains with corpses. Massacred bodies will cover your hills and fill up your valleys and ditches. I'll reduce you to ruins and all your towns will be ghost towns, population zero. Then you'll realize that I am God. Because you said, these two nations, these two countries, are mine. I'm taking over, even though God is right there watching, right there listening, I'll turn your hate-bloated anger and rage right back on you. You'll know I mean business when I bring judgment on you. You'll realize then that I, God, have overheard all the vile abuse you've poured out against the mountains of Israel, saying, they're roadkill and we're going to eat them up. You've strutted around, talking so big, insolently pitting yourselves against me. And I've heard it all. This is the verdict of God, the Master, with the whole earth applauding, I'll demolish you. Since you danced in the streets, thinking it was so wonderful when Israel's inheritance was demolished, I'll give you the same treatment, demolition. Mount Seir demolished, yes, every square inch of Edom. Then they'll realize that I am God. And now, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Say, mountains of Israel, listen to God's message. God, the Master, says, because the enemy crowed over you, good. Those old hills are now ours, now here is a prophecy in the name of God, the Master, because nations came at you from all sides, ripping and plundering, hauling pieces of you off every which way, and you've become the butt of cheap gossip and jokes, therefore, mountains of Israel, listen to the message of God, the Master. My message to mountains and hills, to ditches and valleys, to the heaps of rubble and the emptied towns that are looted for plunder and turned into jokes by all the surrounding nations, therefore, says God, the Master, now I'm speaking in a fiery rage against the rest of the nations, but especially against Edom, who in an orgy of violence and shameless insolence robbed me of my land, grabbed it for themselves. Therefore prophesy over the land of Israel, preach to the mountains and hills, to every ditch and valley, the message of God, the Master, look. Listen. I'm angry, and I care. I'm speaking to you because you've been humiliated among the nations. Therefore I, God, the Master, am telling you that I've solemnly sworn that the nations around you are next. It's their turn to be humiliated. But you, mountains of Israel, will burst with new growth, putting out branches and bearing fruit for my people Israel. My people are coming home. Do you see? I'm back again. I'm on your side. You'll be plowed and planted as before. I'll see to it that your population grows all over Israel, that the towns fill up with people, that the ruins are rebuilt. I'll make this place teem with life, human and animal. The country will burst into life, life, and more life, your towns and villages full of people just as in the old days. I'll treat you better than I ever have. And you'll realize that I am God. I'll put people over you, my own people Israel. They'll take care of you and you'll be their inheritance. 
Never again will you be a harsh and unforgiving land to them. God, the Master, says, because you have a reputation of being a land that eats people alive and makes women barren, I'm now telling you that you'll never eat people alive again nor make women barren. Decree of God, the Master. And I'll never again let the taunts of outsiders be heard over you nor permit nations to look down on you. You'll no longer be a land that makes women barren. Decree of God, the Master. God's message came to me, Son of Man, when the people of Israel lived in their land, they polluted it by the way they lived. I poured out my anger on them because of the polluted blood they poured out on the ground. And so I got thoroughly angry with them polluting the country with their wanton murders and dirty gods. I kicked them out, exiled them to other countries. I sentenced them according to how they had lived. Wherever they went, they gave me a bad name. People said, these are God's people, but they got kicked off his land. I suffered much pain over my holy reputation, which the people of Israel blackened in every country they entered. Therefore, tell Israel, message of God, the Master, I'm not doing this for you, Israel. I'm doing it for me, to save my character, my holy name, which you've blackened in every country where you've gone. I'm going to put my great and holy name on display, the name that has been ruined in so many countries, the name that you blackened wherever you went. Then the nations will realize who I really am, that I am God, when I show my holiness through you so that they can see it with their own eyes. For here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you out of these countries, gather you from all over, and bring you back to your own land. I'll pour pure water over you and scrub you clean. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I'll remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that's God-willed, not self-willed. I'll put my spirit in you and make it possible for you to do what I tell you and live by my commands. You'll once again live in the land I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I'll pull you out of that stinking pollution. I'll give personal orders to the wheat fields, telling them to grow bumper crops. I'll send no more famines. I'll make sure your fruit trees and field crops flourish. Other nations won't be able to hold you in contempt again because of famine. And then you'll think back over your terrible lives, the evil, the shame, and be thoroughly disgusted with yourselves, realizing how badly you've lived, all those obscenities you've carried out. I'm not doing this for you. Get this through your thick heads. Shame on you. What a mess you made of things, Israel. Message of God, the Master, on the day I scrub you clean from all your filthy living, I'll also make your cities livable. The ruins will be rebuilt. The neglected land will be worked again, no longer overgrown with weeds and thistles, worthless in the eyes of passers-by. People will exclaim, why? This weed patch has been turned into a Garden of Eden. And the ruined cities, smashed into oblivion, are now thriving. The nations around you that are still in existence will realize that I, God, rebuild ruins and replant empty waste places. I, God, said so, and I'll do it. Message of God, the Master, yet again I'm going to do what Israel asks. I'll increase their population as with a flock of sheep. Like the milling flocks of sheep brought for sacrifices in Jerusalem during the appointed feasts, the ruined cities will be filled with flocks of people. And they'll realize that I am God. God grabbed me. God's Spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around and among them a lot of bones. 
There were bones all over the plain, dry bones, bleached by the sun. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Master God, only you know that. He said to me, Prophesy over these bones, dry bones, listen to the message of God. God, the Master, told the dry bones, Watch this, I'm bringing the breath of life to you and you'll come to life. I'll attach sinews to you, put meat on your bones, cover you with skin, and breathe life into you. You'll come alive and you'll realize that I am God. I prophesied just as I'd been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound and, oh, rustling. The bones moved and came together, bone to bone. I kept watching. Sinews formed, then muscles on the bones, then skin stretched over them. But they had no breath in them. He said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Tell the breath, God, the Master, says, Come from the four winds. Come, breath. Breathe on these slain bodies. Breathe life. So I prophesied, just as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came alive. They stood up on their feet, a huge army. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they're saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, there's nothing left of us. Therefore, prophesy. Tell them, God, the Master, says, I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive, O my people. Then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you and you'll live. Then I'll lead you straight back to your land and you'll realize that I am God. I've said it and I'll do it. God's Decree God's message came to me, You, son of man, take a stick and write on it, for Judah, with his Israelite companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, Ephraim's stick, together with all his Israelite companions. Then tie the two sticks together so that you're holding one stick. When your people ask you, Are you going to tell us what you're doing, tell them, God, the Master, says, Watch me. I'll take the Joseph stick that is in Ephraim's hand, with the tribes of Israel connected with him, and lay the Judah stick on it. I'll make them into one stick. I'm holding one stick. Then take the sticks you've inscribed and hold them up so the people can see them. Tell them, God, the Master, says, Watch me. I'm taking the Israelites out of the nations in which they've been exiled. I'll gather them in from all directions and bring them back home. I'll make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and give them one king, one king over all of them. Never again will they be divided into two nations, two kingdoms. Never again will they pollute their lives with their no-god idols and all those vile obscenities and rebellions. I'll save them out of all their old sinful haunts. I'll clean them up. They'll be my people. I'll be their God. My servant David will be king over them. They'll all be under one shepherd. They'll follow my laws and keep my statutes. They'll live in the same land I gave my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their grandchildren will live there forever, and my servant David will be their prince forever. I'll make a covenant of peace with them that will hold everything together, an everlasting covenant. I'll make them secure and place my holy place of worship at the center of their lives forever. I'll live right there with them. I'll be their God. 
they'll be my people. The nations will realize that I, God, make Israel holy when my holy place of worship is established at the center of their lives forever. God's message came to me, son of man, confront Gog from the country of Magog, head of Meshech and Tubal. Prophesy against him. Say, God, the Master, says, Be warned, Gog. I am against you, head of Meshech and Tubal. I'm going to turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and drag you off with your whole army, your horses and riders in full armor, all those shields and bucklers and swords, fighting men armed to the teeth. Persia and Cush and Put will be in the ranks, also well armed, as will Gomer and its army in Beth Tagarma out of the north with its army. Many nations will be with you. Get ready to fight, you and the whole company that's been called out. Take charge and wait for orders. After a long time, you'll be given your orders. In the distant future you'll arrive at a country that has recovered from a devastating war. People from many nations will be gathered there on the mountains of Israel, for a long time now a wasteland. These people have been brought back from many countries and now live safe and secure. You'll rise like a thunderstorm and roll in like clouds and cover the land, you and the massed troops with you. Message of God the master, at that time you'll start thinking things over and cook up an evil plot. You'll say, I'm going to invade a country without defenses, attack an unsuspecting, carefree people going about their business, no gates to their cities, no locks on their doors. And I'm going to plunder the place, march right in and clean them out, this rebuilt country risen from the ashes, these returned exiles and their booming economy centered down at the navel of the earth. Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish, traders all out to make a fast buck, will say, so. You've opened a new market for plunder. You've brought in your troops to get rich quick. Therefore, son of man, prophesy. Tell Gog, a message from God, the Master, when my people Israel are established securely, will you make your move? Will you come down out of the far north, you and that mob of armies, charging out on your horses like a tidal wave across the land, and invade my people Israel, covering the country like a cloud? When the time's ripe, I'll unleash you against my land in such a way that the nations will recognize me, realize that through you, Gog, in full view of the nations, I am putting my holiness on display. A message of God, the Master, years ago when I spoke through my servants, the prophets of Israel, wasn't it you I was talking about? Year after year they prophesied that I would bring you against them. And when the day comes, God, you will attack that land of Israel. Decree of God, the Master. My raging anger will erupt. Fueled by blazing jealousy, I tell you that then there will be an earthquake that rocks the land of Israel. Fish and birds and wild animals, even ants and beetles, and every human being will tremble and shake before me. Mountains will disintegrate, terraces will crumble. I'll order all-out war against you, Gog, decree of God, the Master, Gog killing Gog on all the mountains of Israel. I'll deluge Gog with judgment, disease and massacre, torrential rain and hail, volcanic lava pouring down on you and your mobs of troops and people. I'll show you how great I am, how holy I am. I'll make myself known all over the world. Then you'll realize that I am God. Son of man, prophesy against Gog. Say, a message of God, the Master, I'm against you, Gog, head of Meshech and Tubal. I'm going to turn you around and drag you out, drag you out of the far north and down on the mountains of Israel. Then I'll knock your bow out of your left hand and your arrows from your right hand. 
On the mountains of Israel you'll be slaughtered, you and all your troops and the people with you. I'll serve you up as a meal to carrion birds and scavenging animals. You'll be killed in the open field. I've given my word. Decree of God, the Master. I'll set fire to Magog and the far-off islands, where people are so seemingly secure. And they'll realize that I am God. I'll reveal my holy name among my people Israel. Never again will I let my holy name be dragged in the mud. Then the nations will realize that I, God, am the holy in Israel. It's coming. Yes, it will happen. This is the day I've been telling you about. People will come out of the cities of Israel and make a huge bonfire of the weapons of war, piling on shields large and small, bows and arrows, clubs and spears, a fire they'll keep going for seven years. They won't need to go into the woods to get fuel for the fire. There'll be plenty of weapons to keep it going. They'll strip those who strip them. They'll rob those who rob them. Decree of God, the Master. At that time I'll set aside a burial ground for Gog in Israel at Traveler's Rest, just east of the sea. It will obstruct the route of travelers, blocking their way, the mass grave of Gog and his mob of an army. They'll call the place Gog's mob. Israel will bury the corpses in order to clean up the land. It will take them seven months. All the people will turn out to help with the burials. It will be a big day for the people when it's all done and I'm given my due. Men will be hired full-time for the clean-up burial operation and will go through the country looking for defiling, decomposing corpses. At the end of seven months, there will be an all-out final search. Anyone who sees a bone will mark the place with a stick so the buriers can get it and bury it in the mass burial site, Gog's Mob. A town nearby is called Mobville, or Hamina. That's how they'll clean up the land. Son of man, God, the master, says, call the birds. Call the wild animals. Call out, gather and come, gather around my sacrificial meal that I'm preparing for you on the mountains of Israel. You'll eat meat and drink blood. You'll eat off the bodies of great heroes and drink the blood of famous princes as if they were so many rams and lambs, goats and bulls, the choicest grain-fed animals of Bashan. At the sacrificial meal I'm fixing for you, you'll eat fat till you're stuffed and drink blood till you're drunk. At the table I set for you, you'll stuff yourselves with horses and riders, heroes and fighters of every kind. Decree of God, the Master. I'll put my glory on display among the nations and they'll all see the judgment I execute, see me at work handing out judgment. From that day on, Israel will realize that I am their God. And the nations will get the message that it was because of their sins that Israel went into exile. They were disloyal to me and I turned away from them. I turned them over to their enemies and they were all killed. I treated them as their polluted and sin-sated lives deserved. I turned away from them, refused to look at them. But now I will return Jacob back from exile, I'll be compassionate with all the people of Israel, and I'll be zealous for my holy name. Eventually the memory will fade, the memory of their shame over their betrayals of me when they lived securely in their own land, safe and unafraid. Once I've brought them back from foreign parts, gathered them in from enemy territories, I'll use them to demonstrate my holiness with all the nations watching. Then they'll realize for sure that I am their God, for even though I sent them off into exile, I will gather them back to their own land, leaving not one soul behind. After I've poured my spirit on Israel, filled them with my life, I'll no longer turn away. I'll look them full in the face. 
Decree of God, the Master In the twenty-fifth year of our exile, at the beginning of the year on the tenth of the month, it was the fourteenth year after the city fell, God touched me and brought me here. He brought me in divine vision to the land of Israel and set me down on a high mountain. To the south there were buildings that looked like a city. He took me there and I met a man deeply tanned, like bronze. He stood at the entrance holding a linen cord and a measuring stick. The man said to me, Son of man, look and listen carefully. Pay close attention to everything I'm going to show you. That's why you've been brought here. And then tell Israel everything you see. First I saw a wall around the outside of the temple complex. The measuring stick in the man's hand was about ten feet long. He measured the thickness of the wall, about ten feet. The height was also about ten feet. He went into the gate complex that faced the east and went up the seven steps. He measured the depth of the outside threshold of the gate complex, ten feet. There were alcoves flanking the gate corridor, each ten feet square, each separated by a wall seven and a half feet thick. The inside threshold of the gate complex that led to the porch facing into the temple courtyard was ten feet deep. He measured the inside porch of the gate complex, twelve feet deep, flanked by pillars three feet thick. The porch opened onto the temple courtyard. Inside this east gate complex were three alcoves on each side. Each room was the same size and the separating walls were identical. He measured the outside entrance to the gate complex, 15 feet wide and 19 and a half feet deep. In front of each alcove was a low wall 18 inches high. The alcoves were 10 feet square. He measured the width of the gate complex from the outside edge of the alcove roof on one side to the outside edge of the alcove roof on the other, 37 and a half feet from one top edge to the other. He measured the inside walls of the gate complex, 90 feet to the porch leading into the courtyard. The distance from the entrance of the gate complex to the far end of the porch was 75 feet. The alcoves and their connecting walls inside the gate complex were topped by narrow windows all the way around. The porch also. All the windows faced inward. The door jams between the alcoves were decorated with palm trees. The man then led me to the outside courtyard and all its rooms. A paved walkway had been built connecting the courtyard gates. Thirty rooms lined the courtyard. The walkway was the same length as the gateways. It flanked them and ran their entire length. This was the walkway for the outside courtyard. He measured the distance from the front of the entrance gateway across to the entrance of the inner court, 150 feet. Then he took me to the north side. Here was another gate complex facing north, exiting the outside courtyard. He measured its length and width. It had three alcoves on each side. Its gate posts and porch were the same as in the first gate, 87 and a half feet by 43 and three quarters feet. The windows and palm trees were identical to the east gateway. Seven steps led up to it and its porch faced inward. Opposite this gate complex was a gate complex to the inside courtyard, on the north as on the east. The distance between the two was 175 feet. Then he took me to the south side, to the south gate complex. He measured its gate posts and its porch. It was the same size as the others. The porch with its windows was the same size as those previously mentioned. It also had seven steps up to it. Its porch opened onto the outside courtyard, 
with palm trees decorating its gateposts on both sides. Opposite to it, the gate complex for the inner court faced south. He measured the distance across the courtyard from gate to gate, 175 feet. He led me into the inside courtyard through the south gate complex. He measured it and found it the same as the outside ones. Its alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule were the same. The gate complex and porch, windowed all around, measured 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet. The vestibule of each of the gate complexes leading to the inside courtyard was 43 and 3 quarters by 8 and 3 quarters feet. Each vestibule faced the outside courtyard. Palm trees were carved on its doorposts. Eight steps led up to it. He then took me to the inside courtyard on the east and measured the gate complex. It was identical to the others, alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule all the same. The gate complex and vestibule had windows all around. It measured 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet. Its porch faced the outside courtyard. There were palm trees on the doorposts on both sides. And it had eight steps. He brought me to the gate complex to the north and measured it, same measurements. The alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule with its windows, 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet. Its porch faced the outside courtyard. There were palm trees on its doorposts on both sides. And it had eight steps. There was a room with a door at the vestibule of the gate complex where the burnt offerings were cleaned. Two tables were placed within the vestibule, one on either side, on which the animals for burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings were slaughtered. Two tables were also placed against both outside walls of the vestibule, four tables inside and four tables outside, eight tables in all for slaughtering the sacrificial animals. The four tables used for the burnt offerings were 31 and a half inches square and 21 inches high. The tools for slaughtering the sacrificial animals and other sacrifices were kept there. Meat hooks, three inches long, were fastened to the walls. The tables were for the sacrificial animals. Right where the inside gate complex opened onto the inside courtyard there were two rooms, one at the north gate facing south and the one at the south gate facing north. The man told me, the room facing south is for the priests who are in charge of the temple. And the room facing north is for the priests who are in charge of the altar. These priests are the sons of Zadok, the only sons of Levi permitted to come near to God to serve him. He measured the inside courtyard, 175 feet square. The altar was in front of the temple. He led me to the porch of the temple and measured the gate posts of the porch, eight and three quarters feet high on both sides. The entrance to the gate complex was 21 feet wide and its connecting walls were four and a half feet thick. The vestibule itself was 35 feet wide and 21 feet deep. Ten steps led up to the porch. Columns flanked the gate posts. He brought me into the temple itself and measured the doorposts on each side. Each was ten and a half feet thick. The entrance was seventeen and a half feet wide. The walls on each side WER he led me into the inside courtyard through the south gate complex. He measured it and found it the same as the outside ones. Its alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule were the same. The gate complex and porch, windowed all around, measured 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet.
The vestibule of each of the gate complexes leading to the inside courtyard was 43 and 3 quarters by 8 and 3 quarters feet. Each vestibule faced the outside courtyard. Palm trees were carved on its doorposts. Eight steps led up to it. He then took me to the inside courtyard on the east and measured the gate complex. It was identical to the others, alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule all the same. The gate complex and vestibule had windows all around. It measured 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet. Its porch faced the outside courtyard. There were palm trees on the doorposts on both sides. And it had eight steps. He brought me to the gate complex to the north and measured it, same measurements. The alcoves, connecting walls, and vestibule with its windows, 87 and a half by 43 and 3 quarters feet. Its porch faced the outside courtyard. There were palm trees on its doorposts on both sides. And it had eight steps. There was a room with a door at the vestibule of the gate complex where the burnt offerings were cleaned. Two tables were placed within the vestibule, one on either side, on which the animals for burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings were slaughtered. Two tables were also placed against both outside walls of the vestibule, four tables inside and four tables outside, eight tables in all for slaughtering the sacrificial animals. The four tables used for the burnt offerings were 31 and a half inches square and 21 inches high. The tools for slaughtering the sacrificial animals and other sacrifices were kept there. Meat hooks, three inches long, were fastened to the walls. The tables were for the sacrificial animals. Right where the inside gate complex opened onto the inside courtyard there were two rooms, one at the north gate facing south and the one at the south gate facing north. The man told me, the room facing south is for the priests who are in charge of the temple. And the room facing north is for the priests who are in charge of the altar. These priests are the sons of Zadok the only sons of Levi permitted to come near to God to serve him. He measured the inside courtyard, 175 feet square. The altar was in front of the temple. He led me to the porch of the temple and measured the gateposts of the porch, eight and three quarters feet high on both sides. The entrance to the gate complex was 21 feet wide and its connecting walls were four and a half feet thick. The vestibule itself was 35 feet wide and 21 feet deep. Ten steps led up to the porch. Columns flanked the gateposts. E eight and three quarters feet thick. He also measured the temple sanctuary. 70 feet by 35 feet. He went further in and measured the doorposts at the entrance, each was three and a half feet thick. The entrance itself was ten and a half feet wide, and the entrance walls were twelve and a quarter feet thick. He measured the inside sanctuary, 35 feet square, set at the end of the main sanctuary. He told me, this is the Holy of Holies. He measured the wall of the temple. It was ten and a half feet thick. The side rooms around the temple were seven feet wide. There were three floors of these side rooms, thirty rooms on each of the three floors. There were supporting beams around the temple wall to hold up the side rooms, but they were freestanding, not attached to the wall itself. The side rooms around the temple became wider from first floor to second floor to third floor. A staircase went from the bottom floor, through the middle, and then to the top floor. I observed that the temple had a ten and a half foot thick raised base around it, which provided a foundation for the side rooms. 
The outside walls of the side rooms were eight and three quarters feet thick. The open area between the side rooms of the temple and the priest's rooms was a 35-foot wide strip all around the temple. There were two entrances to the side rooms from the open area, one placed on the north side, the other on the south. There were eight and three quarters feet of open space all around. The house that faced the temple courtyard to the west was 122 and a half feet wide, with eight and three quarters foot thick walls. The length of the wall and building was 157 and a half feet. He measured the temple, 175 feet long. The temple courtyard and the house, including its walls, measured 175 feet. The breadth of the front of the temple and the open area to the east was 175 feet. He measured the length of the house facing the courtyard at the back of the temple, including the shelters on each side, 175 feet. The main sanctuary, the inner sanctuary, and the vestibule facing the courtyard were paneled with wood, and had window frames and door frames in all three sections. From floor to windows the walls were paneled. Above the outside entrance to the inner sanctuary and on the walls at regular intervals all around the inner sanctuary and the main sanctuary, angel cherubim and palm trees were carved in alternating sequence. Each angel cherub had two faces, a human face toward the palm tree on the right and the face of a lion toward the palm tree on the left. They were carved around the entire temple. The cherubim palm tree motif was carved from floor to door height on the wall of the main sanctuary. The main sanctuary had a rectangular doorframe. In front of the holy place was something that looked like an altar of wood, five and a quarter feet high and three and a half feet square. Its corners, base, and sides were of wood. The man said to me, this is the table that stands before God. Both the main sanctuary and the holy place had double doors. Each door had two leaves, two hinged leaves for each door, one set swinging inward and the other set outward. The doors of the main sanctuary were carved with angel cherubim and palm trees. There was a canopy of wood in front of the vestibule outside. There were narrow windows alternating with carved palm trees on both sides of the porch. The man led me north into the outside courtyard and brought me to the rooms that are in front of the open space and the house facing north. The length of the house on the north was 175 feet, and its width 87 and a half feet. Across the 35 feet that separated the inside courtyard from the paved walkway at the edge of the outside courtyard, the rooms rose level by level for three stories. In front of the rooms on the inside was a hallway 17 and a half feet wide and 175 feet long. Its entrances were from the north. The upper rooms themselves were narrower, their galleries being wider than on the first and second floors of the building. The rooms on the third floor had no pillars like the pillars in the outside courtyard and were smaller than the rooms on the first and second floors. There was an outside wall parallel to the rooms and the outside courtyard. It fronted the rooms for 87 and a half feet. The row of rooms facing the outside courtyard was 87 and a half feet long. The row on the side nearest the sanctuary was 175 feet long. The first floor rooms had their entrance from the east, coming in from the outside courtyard. On the south side along the length of the courtyard's outside wall and fronting on the temple courtyard were rooms with a walkway in front of them. These were just like the rooms on the north, same exits and dimensions, with the main entrance from the east leading to the hallway and the doors to the rooms the same as those on the north side. The design on the south was a mirror image of that on the north. 
Then he said to me, The north and south rooms adjacent to the open area are holy rooms where the priests who come before God eat the holy offerings. There they place the holy offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. These are set apart rooms, holy space. After the priests have entered the sanctuary, they must not return to the outside courtyard and mingle among the people until they change the sacred garments in which they minister and put on their regular clothes. After he had finished measuring what was inside the temple area, he took me out the east gate and measured it from the outside. Using his measuring stick, he measured the east side, 875 feet. He measured the north side, 875 feet. He measured the south side, 875 feet. Last of all he went to the west side and measured it, 875 feet. He measured the wall on all four sides. Each wall was 875 feet. The walls separated the holy from the ordinary. The man brought me to the east gate. Oh! The bright glory of the God of Israel revered out of the east sounding like the roar of floodwaters, and the earth itself glowed with the bright glory. It looked just like what I had seen when he came to destroy the city, exactly like what I had seen earlier at the Kabar River. And again I fell, face to the ground. The bright glory of God poured into the temple through the east gate. The Spirit put me on my feet and led me to the inside courtyard and, oh! The bright glory of God filled the temple. I heard someone speaking to me from inside the temple while the man stood beside me. He said, Son of man, this is the place for my throne, the place I'll plant my feet. This is the place where I'll live with the Israelites forever. Neither the people of Israel nor their kings will ever again drag my holy name through the mud with their whoring and the no-god idols their kings set up at all the wayside shrines. When they set up their worship shrines right alongside mine with only a thin wall between them, they drag my holy name through the mud with their obscene and vile worship. Is it any wonder that I destroyed them in anger? So let them get rid of their whoring ways and the stinking no-god idols introduced by their kings and I'll move in and live with them forever. Son of man, tell the people of Israel all about the temple so they'll be dismayed by their wayward lives. Get them to go over the layout. That will bring them up short. Show them the whole plan of the temple, its ins and outs, the proportions, the regulations, and the laws. Draw a picture so they can see the design and meaning and live by its design and intent. This is the law of the temple, as it radiates from the top of the mountain, everything around it becomes holy ground. Yes, this is law, the meaning, of the temple. These are the dimensions of the altar, using the long, 21-inch, ruler. The gutter at its base is 21 inches deep and 21 inches wide, with a 4 inch lip around its edge. The height of the altar is 3 and a half feet from the base to the first ledge and 20 inches wide. From the first ledge to the second ledge it is 7 feet high and 21 inches wide. The altar hearth is another 7 feet high. Four horns stick upward from the hearth 21 inches high. The top of the altar, the hearth, is square, 21 by 21 feet. The upper ledge is also square, 24 and a half feet on each side, with a 10 and a half inch lip and a 21 inch wide gutter all the way around. The steps of the altar ascend from the east. Then the man said to me, Son of man, God, the Master, says, These are the ordinances for conduct at the altar when it is built, for sacrificing burnt offerings and sprinkling blood on it. For a sin offering, give a bull to the priests, 
the Levitical priests who are from the family of Zadok who come into my presence to serve me. Take some of its blood and smear it on the four horns of the altar that project from the four corners of the top ledge and all around the lip. That's to purify the altar and make it fit for the sacrifice. Then take the bull for the sin offerings and burn it in the place set aside for this in the courtyard outside the sanctuary. On the second day, offer a male goat without blemish for a sin offering. Purify the altar the same as you purified it for the bull. Then, when you have purified it, offer a bull without blemish and a ram without blemish from the flock. Present them before God. Sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to God. For seven days, prepare a goat for a sin offering daily, and also a bull and a ram from the flock, animals without blemish. For seven days the priests are to get the altar ready for its work, purifying it. This is how you dedicate it. After these seven days of dedication, from the eighth day on, the priests will present your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. And I'll accept you with pleasure, with delight. Decree of God, the Master. Then the man brought me back to the outside gate complex of the sanctuary that faces east. But it was shut. God spoke to me, this gate is shut and it's to stay shut. No one is to go through it because God, the God of Israel, has gone through it. It stays shut. Only the prince, because he's the prince, may sit there to eat in the presence of God. He is to enter the gate complex through the porch and leave by the same way. The man led me through the north gate to the front of the temple. I looked, and, oh, the bright glory of God filling the temple of God. I fell on my face in worship. God said to me, Son of man, get a grip on yourself. Use your eyes, use your ears, pay careful attention to everything I tell you about the ordinances of this temple of God, the way all the laws work, instructions regarding it and all the entrances and exits of the sanctuary. Tell this bunch of rebels, this family Israel, message of God, the Master, no more of these vile obscenities, Israel, dragging irreverent and unrepentant outsiders, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, into my sanctuary, feeding them the sacrificial offerings as if it were the food for a neighborhood picnic. With all your vile obscenities, you've broken trust with me, the solemn covenant I made with you. You haven't taken care of my holy things. You've hired out the work to foreigners who care nothing for this place, my sanctuary. No irreverent and unrepentant aliens, uncircumcised in heart or flesh, not even the ones who live among Israelites, are to enter my sanctuary. The Levites who walked off and left me, along with everyone else, all Israel, who took up with all the no-god idols, will pay for everything they did wrong. From now on they'll do only the menial work in the sanctuary, guard the gates and help out with the temple chores, and also kill the sacrificial animals for the people and serve them. Because they acted as priests to the no-god idols and made my people Israel stumble and fall, I've taken an oath to punish them. Decree of God, the Master. Yes, they'll pay for what they've done. They're fired from the priesthood. No longer will they come into my presence and take care of my holy things. No more access to the holy place. They'll have to live with what they've done, carry the shame of their vile and obscene lives. From now on, their job is to sweep up and run errands. That's it. But the Levitical priests who descend from Zadok, who faithfully took care of my sanctuary when everyone else went off and left me, are going to come into my presence and serve me. They are going to carry out the priestly work of offering the solemn sacrifices of worship. Decree of God, the Master. 
They're the only ones permitted to enter my sanctuary. They're the only ones to approach my table and serve me, accompanying me in my work. When they enter the gate complex of the inside courtyard, they are to dress in linen. No woolens are to be worn while serving at the gate complex of the inside courtyard or inside the temple itself. They're to wear linen turbans on their heads and linen underclothes, nothing that makes them sweat. When they go out into the outside courtyard where the people gather, they must first change out of the clothes they have been serving in, leaving them in the sacred rooms where they change to their everyday clothes, so that they don't trivialize their holy work by the way they dress. They are to neither shave their heads nor let their hair become unkempt, but must keep their hair trimmed and neat. No priest is to drink on the job, no wine while in the inside courtyard. Priests are not to marry widows or divorcees, but only Israelite virgins or widows of priests. Their job is to teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, to show them how to discern between unclean and clean. When there's a difference of opinion, the priests will arbitrate. They'll decide on the basis of my judgments, laws, and statutes. They are in charge of making sure the appointed feasts are honored and my Sabbaths kept holy in the ways I've commanded. A priest must not contaminate himself by going near a corpse. But when the dead person is his father or mother, son or daughter, brother or unmarried sister, he can approach the dead. But after he has been purified, he must wait another seven days. Then, when he returns to the inside courtyard of the sanctuary to do his priestly work in the sanctuary, he must first offer a sin offering for himself. Decree of God, the Master. As to priests owning land, I am their inheritance. Don't give any land in Israel to them. I am their land, their inheritance. They'll take their meals from the grain offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings. Everything in Israel offered to God in worship is theirs. The best of everything grown, plus all special gifts, comes to the priests. All that is given in worship to God goes to them. Serve them first. Serve from your best and your home will be blessed. Priests are not to eat any meat from bird or animal unfit for ordinary human consumption, such as carcasses found dead on the road or in the field. When you divide up the inheritance of the land, you must set aside part of the land as sacred space for God, approximately seven miles long by six miles wide, all of it holy ground. Within this rectangle, reserve a 750-foot square for the sanctuary with a 75-foot buffer zone surrounding it. Mark off within the sacred reserve a section 7 miles long by 3 miles wide. The sanctuary with its holy of holies will be placed there. This is where the priests will live, those who lead worship in the sanctuary and serve God there. Their houses will be there along with the holy place. To the north of the sacred reserve, an area roughly seven miles long and two and a quarter miles wide will be set aside as land for the villages of the Levites who administer the affairs of worship in the sanctuary. To the south of the sacred reserve, measure off a section seven miles long and about a mile and a half wide for the city itself, an area held in common by the whole family of Israel. The prince gets the land abutting the seven-mile east and west borders of the central sacred square, extending eastward toward the Jordan and westward toward the Mediterranean. This is the prince's possession in Israel. My princes will no longer bully my people, running rushod over them. They'll respect the land as it has been allotted to the tribes. This is the message of God, the Master, I've put up with you long enough, princes of Israel. Quit bullying and taking advantage of my people. Do what's just and right for a change. 
Use honest scales, honest weights and honest measures. Every pound must have 16 ounces. Every gallon must measure 4 quarts. The ounce is the basic measure for both. And your coins must be honest, no wooden nickels. These are the prescribed offerings you are to supply, 1 60th part of your wheat, 1 60th part of your barley, 1 hundredth part of your oil, 1 sheep out of every 200 from the lush pastures of Israel. These will be used for the grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings for making the atonement sacrifices for the people. Decree of God, the Master Everyone in the land must contribute to these special offerings that the prince in Israel will administer. It's the prince's job to provide the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the holy festivals, the new moons, and the Sabbaths, all the commanded feasts among the people of Israel. Sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings for making atonement for the people of Israel are his responsibility. This is the message from God, the Master, on the first day of the first month, take an unblemished bull calf and purify the sanctuary. The priest is to take blood from the sin offerings and rub it on the doorposts of the temple, on the four corners of the ledge of the altar, and on the gate entrance to the inside courtyard. Repeat this ritual on the seventh day of the month for anyone who sins without knowing it. In this way you make atonement for the temple. On the fourteenth day of the first month, you will observe the Passover, a feast of seven days. During the feast you will eat bread made without yeast. On Passover, the prince supplies a bull as a sin offering for himself and all the people of the country. Each day for each of the seven days of the feast, he will supply seven bulls and seven rams unblemished as a burnt offering to God, and also each day a male goat. He will supply about five and a half gallons of grain offering and a gallon of oil for each bull and each ram. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, and on each of the seven days of the feast, he is to supply the same materials for sin offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and oil. Message from God, the Master, the gate of the inside courtyard on the east is to be shut on the six working days, but open on the Sabbath. It is also to be open on the new moon. The prince will enter through the entrance area of the gate complex and stand at the gateposts as the priests present his burnt offerings and peace offerings while he worships there on the porch. He will then leave, but the gate won't be shut until evening. On Sabbaths and new moons, the people are to worship before God at the outside entrance to that gate complex. The prince supplies for God the burnt offering for the Sabbath, six unblemished lambs and an unblemished ram. The grain offering to go with the ram is about five and a half gallons plus a gallon of oil, and a handful of grain for each lamb. At the new moon he is to supply a bull calf, six lambs, and a ram, all without blemish. He will also supply five and a half gallons of grain offering and a gallon of oil for both ram and bull, and a handful of grain offering for each lamb. When the prince enters, he will go through the entrance vestibule of the gate complex and leave the same way. But when the people of the land come to worship God at the commanded feasts, those who enter through the north gate will exit from the south gate, and those who enter through the south gate will exit from the north gate. You don't exit the gate through which you enter, but through the opposite gate. The prince is to be there, mingling with them, going in and out with them. At the festivals and the commanded feasts, the appropriate grain offering is five and a half gallons, with a gallon of oil for the bull and ram and a handful of grain for each lamb. When the prince brings a freewill offering to God, whether a burnt offering or a peace offering, the east gate is to be open for him. 
He offers his burnt or peace offering the same as he does on the Sabbath. Then he leaves, and after he is out, the gate is shut. Every morning you are to bring a yearling lamb unblemished for a burnt offering to God. Also, every morning bring a grain offering of about a gallon of grain with a quart or so of oil to moisten it. Presenting this grain offering to God is standard procedure. The lamb, the grain offering, and the oil for the burnt offering are a regular daily ritual. A message from God, the Master, if the prince deeds a gift from his inheritance to one of his sons, it stays in the family. But if he deeds a gift from his inheritance to a servant, the servant keeps it only until the year of liberation, the jubilee year. After that, it comes back to the prince. His inheritance is only for his sons. It stays in the family. The prince must not take the inheritance from any of the people, dispossessing them of their land. He can give his sons only what he himself owns. None of my people are to be run off their land. Then the man brought me through the north gate into the holy chambers assigned to the priests and showed me a back room to the west. He said, This is the kitchen where the priests will cook the guilt offering and sin offering and bake the grain offering so that they won't have to do it in the outside courtyard and endanger the unprepared people out there with the holy. He proceeded to take me to the outside courtyard and around to each of its four corners. In each corner I observed another court. In each of the four corners of the outside courtyard were smaller courts 60 by 45 feet, each the same size. On the inside walls of the courts was a stone shelf, and beneath the shelves, hearths for cooking. He said, these are the kitchens where those who serve in the temple will cook the sacrifices of the people. Now he brought me back to the entrance to the temple. I saw water pouring out from under the temple porch to the east, the temple faced east. The water poured from the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then took me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the gate complex on the east. The water was gushing from under the south front of the temple. He walked to the east with a measuring tape and measured off 1500 feet, leading me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another 1500 feet, leading me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another 1500 feet, leading me through water waist deep. He measured off another 1500 feet. By now it was a river over my head, water to swim in, water no one could possibly walk through. He said, Son of man, have you had a good look? Then he took me back to the river bank. While sitting on the bank, I noticed a lot of trees on both sides of the river. He told me, this water flows east, descends to the Araba and then into the sea, the sea of stagnant waters. When it empties into those waters, the sea will become fresh. Wherever the river flows, life will flourish, great schools of fish, because the river is turning the salt sea into fresh water. Where the river flows, life abounds. Fishermen will stand shoulder to shoulder along the shore from Engedi all the way north to Eniglaim, casting their nets. The sea will teem with fish of all kinds, like the fish of the great Mediterranean. The swamps and marshes won't become fresh. They'll stay salty. But the river itself, on both banks, will grow fruit trees of all kinds. Their leaves won't wither, the fruit won't fail. Every month they'll bear fresh fruit because the river from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. A message from God, the Master, these are the boundaries by which you are to divide up the inheritance of the land for the twelve tribes of Israel, with Joseph getting two parcels. It is to be divided up equally. 
I swore in a solemn oath to give it to your ancestors, swore that this land would be your inheritance. These are the boundaries of the land. The northern boundary runs from the great Mediterranean Sea along the Hethlen Road to where you turn off to the entrance of Hamath, Zedad, Berotha, and Sibrain, which lies between the territory of Damascus and the territory of Hamath, and on to Hazer Hadakan on the border of Horn. The boundary runs from the sea to Hazer Enon, with the territories of Damascus and Hamath to the north. That is the northern boundary. The eastern boundary runs between Damascus and Horan, down along the Jordan between Gilead and the land of Israel to the eastern sea as far as Tamar. This is the eastern boundary. The southern boundary runs west from Tamar to the waters of Meribah Kadesh, along the brook of Egypt, and out to the great Mediterranean Sea. This is the southern boundary. The western boundary is formed by the Great Mediterranean Sea north to where the road turns east toward the entrance to Hamath. This is the western boundary. Divide up this land among the twelve tribes of Israel. Divide it up as your inheritance, and include in it the resident aliens who have made themselves at home among you and now have children. Treat them as if they were born there, just like yourselves. They also get an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the resident alien lives, there he gets his inheritance. Decree of God, the Master. These are the tribes. Dan, one portion, along the northern boundary, following the Hethlen road that turns off to the entrance of Hamath as far as Hazer Enon so that the territory of Damascus lies to the north alongside Hamath, the northern border stretching from east to west. Asher, one portion, bordering Dan from east to west. Naphtali, one portion, bordering Asher from east to west. Manasseh, one portion, bordering Naphtali from east to west. Ephraim, one portion, bordering Manasseh from east to west. Reuben, one portion, bordering Ephraim from east to west. Judah, one portion, bordering Reuben from east to west. Bordering Judah from east to west is the consecrated area that you will set aside as holy, a square approximately seven by seven miles, with the sanctuary set at the center. The consecrated area reserved for God is to be seven miles long and a little less than three miles wide. This is how it will be parceled out. The priest will get the area measuring 7 miles on the north and south boundaries, with a width of a little more than 3 miles at the east and west boundaries. The sanctuary of God will be at the center. This is for the consecrated priests, the Zadokites who stayed true in their service to me and didn't get off track as the Levites did when Israel wandered off the main road. This is their special gift, a gift from the land itself, most holy ground, bordering the section of the Levites. The Levites get a section equal in size to that of the priests, roughly 7 by 3 miles. They are not permitted to sell or trade any of it. It's the choice part of the land, to say nothing of being holy to God. What's left of the sacred square, each side measures out at seven miles by a mile and a half, is for ordinary use, the city and its buildings with open country around it, but the city at the center. The north, south, east, and west sides of the city are each about a mile and a half in length. A strip of pasture, 125 yards wide, will border the city on all sides. The remainder of this portion, three miles of countryside to the east and to the west of the sacred precinct, is for farming. It will supply food for the city. Workers from all the tribes of Israel will serve as field hands to farm the land. This dedicated area, set apart for holy purposes, will be a square, seven miles by seven miles, 
a holy square, which includes the part set aside for the city. The rest of this land, the country stretching east to the Jordan and west to the Mediterranean from the seven-mile sides of the holy square, belongs to the prince. His land is sandwiched between the tribal portions north and south, and goes out both east and west from the sacred square with its temple at the center. The land set aside for the Levites on one side and the city on the other is in the middle of the territory assigned to the prince. The sacred square is flanked east and west by the prince's land and bordered on the north and south by the territories of Judah and Benjamin, respectively. And then the rest of the tribes. Benjamin, one portion, stretching from the eastern to the western boundary. Simeon, one portion, bordering Benjamin from east to west. Issachar, one portion, bordering Simeon from east to west. Zebulun, one portion, bordering Issachar from east to west. Gad, one portion, bordering Zebulun from east to west. The southern boundary of Gad will run south from Tamar to the waters of Meribah Kadesh, along the brook of Egypt and then out to the great Mediterranean Sea. This is the land that you are to divide up among the tribes of Israel as their inheritance. These are their portions. Decree of God, the Master. These are the gates of the city. On the north side, which is 2,250 yards long, the gates of the city are named after the tribes of Israel, three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, the gate of Levi. On the east side, measuring 2,250 yards, three gates, the gate of Joseph, the gate of Benjamin, the gate of Dan. On the south side, measuring 2,250 yards, three gates, the gate of Simeon, the gate of Issachar, the gate of Zebulun. On the west side, measuring 2,250 yards, three gates, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, the gate of Naphtali. The four sides of the city measure to a total of nearly six miles.